today on Hot Program, we are interviewing the one and only James Apperson. Let's go. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to Hot Program. I am your host with the most from the East Coast, and I am joined by a man who has read the entire Bible (laughs) many, many times, and now no longer believes in any gods at all. How you doing? A man who needs no introduction, my one black friend. And folks, Hi, folks, Hi, as you know, we don't mess around here. We have been scouring the interwebs deep in the community, trying to figure out who could we interview that is interesting and amazing and has wonderful things to teach us and share with us. And folks, I have found one of your favorites, a person I know you love interacting with in those chats, in those comment sections and reading his blogs and catching them on YouTube. Welcome to Hot Program, James Apperson. We are super, super excited that you could join us today. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, um, I'm going to, uh, I normally turn things over to my one black friend because he is our resident Bible nerd. Uh, and he likes for people to get started with their favorite Bible verses. But on today's occasion, I thought I'd do something a little bit different which is that uh, instead of Bible verses, because I figured that might not be so much your thing, uh, (laughs) I I recently found your uh, blog post, and I found this to really speak to me. And so if it's okay with you guys, I thought at least I'll start with maybe the beginning of this, uh, get my one black friend's thoughts, and then maybe we can can jump into this and, and we can talk about this, and wherever the conversation goes from there, we'll let it go. Is that cool with you guys? It's cool with me. Fair yeah. warning to every to everyone. It's a fairly long blog. I really probably need to cut it in two at some point. But yeah, yeah, I thought we might not get the whole thing because I was scrolling through it, and I haven't read the whole thing myself because I like to kind of react to things in person. But I read the beginning, and I was like, "Oh, this is super good. We should definitely talk about this." Uh, quick shout out, Cameron, BCS, Lewis, KCA, Randy. See you guys. Uh, thanks so much for being here, chat. Um, uh, you know, links in the description if you want more from me or more, more from my one black friend. Uh, and folks, uh, head o- follow James Apperson on Facebook. He's, he's pretty easy to find. You can find this blog post. He posted this on June 29th, uh, 2022. It's entitled, uh, oh, is this a, is this a, is this a, this first title, Understanding Religion's Relationship to Human Social Systems? Is this like a theme you the, have? That's, that's the blog category, yeah. So. That's the blog category. Right, right. Great. And then the title is what Christians are actually recruiting for and who that actually works on. All right, guys. Many people who identify as Christian, quote unquote, don't really bother with the details. They just casually identify with Jesus, believe in God, and that's about it. But the larger phenomenon they aren't paying much attention to is a con game. That game doesn't work on sufficiently mature adults. This is why so many end up leaving it. People grow. If they grow fast enough, they'll have time to grow mentally tall enough without even expecting to. They can suddenly see what is re- what it is really what what it was really all about, sorry. However, it does often attract and hold people who have certain <laughs> prerequisite vulnerabilities. Wondering if you're the sort of person it works on, let's find out. All right, so let's let's stop there. Uh, here's the wind up in the pitch. Yeah, yeah. Tell tell us what you're thinking here. By the way, I just want to say uh, I really like the way this is written. Uh, I'm a big fan of ellipses and making sure you use punctuation to get the reader to pause for dramatic effect where you want them to. And and I really enjoy your writing. And it's always new. This is why we do this to discover things about the community, right? And I've always just seen you in chats or popping up on panels. And I read this and thinking, man, I'm a big fan of James's writing. Uh, but go ahead. That's all. Yeah, yeah. What were you thinking with this? Uh, Just kind of lead us into this. All right. So 
whenever I write a blog like this of a very complex nature, it goes through several revisions because I always have to go back and uh, temper the parts that are maybe a bit too sharp and um, specify the parts that are maybe a bit too broad um, because I want to make certain necessary distinctions. I don't think that everybody who identifies as Christian is actively part of some con game. I think that they, you know, some people who just don't think that much about it are kind of like kind of outside that phenomenon because they're not actively engaged with it. Um, but I, I, it's tricky for me because when I go on the Bread of Life live streams, I'm trying to be so fair because that's her channel. And I don't want to go on her channel and try to sabotage what she's trying to accomplish. Right. And you're talking and, about Rebecca from Bread of Life, right. Examining Evolution. We actually uh, interviewed Rebecca a couple of weeks ago. Thanks for the plug. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and check that out. But yeah, go ahead. So it's a catch-22 for me because I'm talking with two audiences. The, the, the atheist skeptical audience, I want to encourage them to um, take ownership of their own lives and, and recognize with confidence that the whole darn thing is a crazy con game. But when I'm talking with Christians, with believers, I don't want to come at it from that angle at all because I want them to simply keep maturing, keep growing, because I know that the inevitable result is that if they're in a, a harsh version of Christianity, it will gradually temper itself. It will it will soften, all the edges will soften, and it will become more secular without them even meaning to. And, and Rebecca, without realizing, is kind of already on that path. Sure, sure. And sure, absolutely. And I want to encourage that, not just for her, but for the Christians, because I don't think that coming out full force attacking Christianity is necessarily the answer. Certainly banning it wouldn't be the answer, even if we could do that. The, the real answer is just nurturing progress uh, with, with the ideals of the secular enlightenment and, and, and try to help these people gradually grow. Because otherwise Hang on one a second. Uh, Scott Stell, do you, are you referring to the uh, gradually becoming more secular? Uh, when you say, does, does he really believe that? I wonder exactly what you're referring to. But continue, continue, James. And, and yes, James genuinely believes that. But I'm not even going to ask you that, but go well, ahead. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, as soon as we get confirmation what he means, I'll be happy to. Sure, sure, to sure. So oh, he said yes. Like he said yes. About the, saying. I think about the progressing towards something more secular. So I guess maybe say a little bit more why you think it. Because uh, I guess some people could say sometimes, you know, it goes the opposite way, right? And you progress into something more extremist or whatever. So what, what sort of pulls you into the optimal, the optimist position there? So with increasing exposure to persons of secular values, um, there, is, there is a natural sociological effect on the way that people think. We, we normalize certain ways of thinking and behaving that aren't necessarily normalized within conservative echo chambers. And so yeah. that's what happened with the Quakers. The Quakers rose up at one point and led the abolitionist movement in America. And, you know, of course they want to say, well, God directed their steps to do so. And it's tricky because while I know that that's not true, God didn't do any such thing. It, it, <laughs> The only way to encourage that kind of growth is to humor the premise, to say, okay, sure, mm, that's what you want to yeah. believe, you know, whatever, go with that. So I don't want to directly challenge that idea when it's, um, when they're basically giving themselves license or permission to grow. And if they feel like the only way to give themselves license and permission to grow is, a, is, a, is for them to suppose that they're doing so under, under the inspiration of a God, then that simply is the only way they're going to go through that growth. And wow. so that's what happened with the Quakers. That's what happened with the stories of Jesus. Because if you go back to the stories of Jesus, no matter how much of it's true or not true, talking about a guy who for his day was very progressive. And so he wasn't saying, let's get rid of Judaism. He was saying, let's go for a, a more progressive approach mm. to how we interpret and enforce these laws. A kinder, because, gentler Judaism or Hebraic law. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's that ideal. People people that are deeply psychologically rooted in those cultures need to feel like they have sanction from their God to do that progressing. Yeah. And I and just so, want to quickly say, uh, Scott, Stel, I, I, I think um, I think we, we've obviously see what's going on in the USA currently. James, are you in the, in the U.S.? Where are you where are you at? I am. So yeah. I'm in the Bible Belt You're, part of it, Indiana. So. Yeah. But I think oh, where I'm from. I think that also speaks right. to kind of your point, because I think a lot of those people are not 
exposing themselves deeply to uh, secular you know, people. Um, But also, I would say that what this makes me think of, and I want to make sure my one black friend gets in here, but what this does remind me of is peer learning, right? Which isn't always effective, but one of the things I've really learned, and there's good research on this, is basically, I could say something all day long as a teacher, and a lot of students will get it. For a lot of students, though, it goes in one ear, out the other. One of their peers can say the same exact thing and the light bulb will go off and they just right. get it, right? It's just a magic to the peer credibility thing or whatever. Now, does this work yes. all the time? No. But one of the really <laughs> powerful things that makes it work so well and makes it work reliably, and this is kind of, I think, to back up your point, is there's this thing where overwhelmingly, by and large, it's easier for students who have the right answer to convince students who don't have the right answer to change their mind. Now, right. does every once in a while you get a student who has the right answer um, to change that right answer to a wrong answer because they were convinced by the student who was wrong? That does happen once in a while, mm-hmm. but very rarely. Why? Right. Because that student's wrong, right? And so if sure. most of us at the end of the day have humanist values at, of, at some level, like it's better not to steal, it's better not to kill, what you're kind of saying is if you're exposed yourself to sec- those of us that are influenced in the right direction, there's going to be sort of a gravitational pull. Yeah, you're going to pull some people the other way once in a while, but overall, the, the, the sort of overwhelming mass of pro-socialism probably is going to pull people gradually towards a more reasonable position. And after that, I just yeah. want to make sure my one black friend gets in and said, but thanks for, for humoring my uh, teacher analogy. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Pocket Locker, can you pull up his uh, his blog again? Y- yeah, you don't see it? I-, I see the images of us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you want, you want me to scroll up to the text? Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. So, yeah. um I want to just jump in here. That game doesn't work on sufficiently mature adults. Uh, you didn't a little further down. You comment. Mm, it, it, however, it does attract and hold people who have certain prerequisite vulnerabilities. Um, we do see in the church today, if we look at Kenneth Copeland's audience, uh, you see a lot of seniors in there, a lot of senior citizens in that audience. Sure, and, absolutely. And I, I, I do think uh, in many churches you have a senior citizen audience because it was their lifestyle, right? These are people they've grown with and they've watched them have families and have had enduring friendships with. And I do wonder how often that is the reason for staying in church when you see how things have deteriorated and continue to do so in the world. Also, you see the progress, but the progress might even seem to be pushing those people out or giving them that feeling that they're being pushed out mm-hmm. and church is all they have left. So I, right. I, I, I do want to let people know, I can see in here, you've acknowledged that. Mm-hmm. You've acknowledged that that's a, a factor uh, that's, you know, it, it's not always so obvious. I know there's a lot of focus on the youth uh, of today in the United States not being as religious as previous generations. I think that's only going to intensify uh, I do too. I, think, I do too. I think there are certain factors at work with we read about how the internet impacts things, and I feel this Supreme Court decision to where a teacher can pray in school is really going to do it. I think that's going to oh, work that's, against them, and yeah, they have just, they they are not prepared for how no. awful it's going to be because of that one thing, because there are going to be students like. I was who go, no, wait a second. In Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, you're not supposed to be doing this. You can go into your closet and pray, but you're not supposed to do it. Why? So we can see you pray. Is that it? So fantastic. Congrats on being righteous. Go you. That was awesome. Now, can you please teach me something about the world that I can use? Yeah. Now, I want to quickly just to say shout outs to uh, Lena. Appreciate you coming through, dropping bombs. Uh, uh, thank you for your support, and we appreciate to have you listening, even if you uh, can't chat as much as you'd like. But this whole, this is why we need atheist churches. Uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we're all about around here. Um, James, can you comment on that, please? And uh, also, uh, uh, we'd love churches. to talk to T-Chop yes. about it more. But yeah, go ahead, James. Love to hear your thoughts so, on I mean, that. 
the atheist church thing. I mean, I totally get that. And I watched what happened when there was atheist quote unquote churches on the West coast near Seattle. Mm -hmm. And the problem that they found was that they, um, they were polarizing in ways that were actually causing sects, atheist sects to to branch off with, with different ideas about, you know, what it means to be, um, atheist in a meaningful sense because atheism by itself just the word only means you don't believe in a god mm-hmm. it's it, to get any further than that you have to add something to it like secular humanism you can't just yes you know, there has to be more than that yes and, and it, so good go ahead. no no i was just gonna say uh i've i spent a lot of time thinking through this and and i certainly don't think that you know what we're trying to do is like a one-stop shop or a solution and to be honest it's a parody right you have to understand what we're trying to do with the cult of the flying man is a parody church right like let's just be clear about that right oh okay yeah the same way the same way satanism is right but what i realized was that politically they could do things like i like i was really motivated when i saw them uh oppose uh earlier you know attempts at the state level to uh attack reproductive rights because they said no your uh anti-abortion stance violates my religious value of bodily autonomy and i was like oh i see what y'all did there i like that that's mm -hmm. very clever right and then i liked Mm -hmm. how they said oh you're gonna have a national day of prayer great cool we'll meet you at the state capitol in the rotunda hail satan hail satan you know and they have arn rock giving the speech and then they're like oh cool y'all like religious statues yeah we want a uh beezlebub uh at the at the at the yeah the (laughs) baffle met right yeah yeah so i started about the satanists yeah i love it i loved it and i just what i recognize james and, and this is great for us to talk about this amongst our community is i just said the cult of the flying man is kind of our own thing like we've all we've got our kind of our own little counter apologetic that we like to rally around and i think it's an sure. effective one because it's it's basically the outsider test of faith right for me the outsider test of faith has always been one of the most powerful things the cult of the flying man is kind of just a fun little internet meme twist on it um and the other thing is teaching when i teach my class i teach um we teach about the rye aliens right i teach this class called darwin's law <laughs> i'm always going on about this because rob pennock he was the uh expert witness in the kitz miller versus dover trial that uh he said that uh you know intelligent design creationism isn't science and it shouldn't be taught in the science classroom and so really that guy is now a professor of digital evolution at michigan state university and i happen to be teaching darwin's law with him right and when we teach our students this class it is it's it's a unbelievable like knock myself over i can't believe pinch myself i can't believe this is my my job type of thing right uh, by yeah. the way we're hoping to stream it this semester too so look for that coming up uh, but we teach this and we teach the Rielians, who people don't know. The Rielians is this religion that believes in a creation narrative, but they believe it was natural. They believe there's like a supreme race of beings uh, that, you know, like kind of use our planet as a little laboratory and they're kind of playing around with us, right? Um, sure. And the point is that this is a creation myth, and obviously the religious right would never want you to teach this in a class. Right. And so it's just kind of used as an example of, hey, you guys want to be, you know, you know, say creation narrative should be in the classroom. Well, would you let us teach the right aliens? Obviously not. And so that's literally part of his book is explaining this, right? And so yes. I kind of noticed that the whole flying man thing was like a similar kind of Trojan horse, right? Like, sure, uh, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was the, the flying spaghetti monster kind of thing. Exactly. Yes, exactly. That's exactly mm-hmm. what I was thinking. I was, it reminded me all the whole, the flying spaghetti monster thing. But again, the flying spaghetti monster thing is just out there in the world. There's already an established church of that. It has nothing to do with us. Whereas as like Pine Creeksters, we could be like, hey, the flying man's our thing, you know? Um, But yeah, so (laughs) just to speak to this quickly, uh, I thought that was useful because 
I don't think we're going to grow or become like super powerful or influencing, but maybe now we could write a letter and sign a petition and say, hey, what, and again, to speak to your point, you have to add some stuff to it, right? So we really looked into this. We realized you have to have values. So our values are like uh, humanism, science, and critical thinking or something like that. Some stuff we could actually all probably say we're on board with, right? But now we sure. could probably write a letter to the state capitol and say, hey, the, the call to the flying man, not that you care about us, but we really think you're you're violating our humanist bodily autonomy with these Roe v. Wade laws. And by the way, we would love to see a statue of Myron flying over the Grand Canyon outside the courthouse. <laughs> now, do I think they're going to do it? No, no. But I actually thought it'd be fun, and we could probably get some funny streams out of making it and sending it off, right? Um, right. Absolutely. But then sort Make of... A statement. Right. But then the mm -hmm. other thing kind of really started to touch me, like the need for community and the need to just get together regularly. And so what started as kind of a joke, uh, part of it was I looked at the Stephen, uh, the John Oliver, you know, uh, church, Our, Our Lady of Perpetual Exemption, uh, <laughs> you know, how to fund a tax exempt church uh, skit or whatever. Oh, yeah. And so I looked up yeah. all the, we looked at the IRS codes to figure out what you got to do to actually be a church. And so we started to build those things into the stream. That way, when we go to file the paperwork, we're like, yeah, we do. And so it became like, hey, I do actually host these shows regularly. We get together every Sunday. We tend to study words together. And, you know, I built in a little communion ritual. And we've uh, got our ushers and our deacons. And so it's just become fun. But uh, I just wanted to briefly circle, circle back to the idea that this whole need for an atheist church, I really think is just a human need for community. And what we're saying that, is just because you no longer believe the claims of a religion doesn't mean you forego those human needs. Sure. And Carl Jung wrote extensively about this. And it's I think Jordan Peterson largely misunderstood Carl Jung in ironic ways. But um, he recognized that we need um, community and, and meaning and things like that. But. Um, we, what we don't need is the magical, mystical thinking, and we certainly don't need mm -hmm. to politicize um, special interests to where we leverage power and authority over others. But we need an equitable society is what we need, where those people can think and live how they want to, and so can those people over there. And um, I think that needs to be the goal. Go ahead. Uh, James, uh, do you think that things like tax ex – sorry to ruin it for you, pocket locker. Do you think <laughs> – because if I if I get elected, if I ever become president of the United States, you're getting rid of that. This, this is going to go on the first day if right. I can help it. I'm going to get rid of the uh, exemption for clergy, so they have to pay taxes. Um, In do you principle, think that, I love the idea. Do you think that that is to, when I when I see that, uh, it seems to me that that's a way to keep those who administer the religion to the religious in their back pockets, the politicians to do that. Because, hey, look, we're giving you something and you're saving thousands, if not millions of dollars a year because we do this for you. Mm -hmm. If you start, if you don't support us, we can take it away. We can make it so you have to pay that. Because even Jesus, right? Render unto Caesar what mm -hmm. is Caesar. So he's right. saying you got to pay your taxes. But, but do you think that does that in any way happen to advance society or nope? It's another one of those things that is not advancing society. It holds us back from progress that we could sure, do. Sure, I agree hundred percent. So my, my biggest concern about that, about taxing the churches, and I and I and in principle I agree with the, agree with doing it. The clergy. Is, the clergy. Yeah. What I don't what I don't want to do if we if we were to tax the churches or tax the clergy, um, is kind of give them an open ticket to um, go ahead and become uh, po overly politicized where they, they they exert pressure on billions of people to think and vote a certain way and they, they, they're they like able to do that without any restriction now because now they're taxed. So we would need to make sure there are certain laws in place to make sure that they can't exert mass undue influence over the way people vote mm -hmm. because that would that would come back to bite i also so, wonder sometimes I think that's already happening i think they're already doing it. Sorry, yeah, they all, like, if right. you look at if you look at uh, uh oh, any of these guys that uh um telltale atheist has on his channel where he profiles them or if you look at the oh gosh what uh john not john Locke, 
Greg Locke, Pastor Greg mm-hmm. Locke, up there yeah. hooting and hollering, Trump sure. won, Trump won. And I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. He doesn't even know. He, he doesn't even need to be embarrassed because that crowd is with him. I don't right. know what percentage. Yeah, yeah, that's but crazy. There he is yeah. doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. And there's there's no backlash. There's, there's none. There's no, They'll nothing. never do it. You know yeah, what? N- nothing I'll, I'll give you an interesting him. anecdote because of that. And this ties into a lot of these things that come up. This is one of the things I love about a parody religion is I h- hope something doesn't work in the parody religion as a reflection of the real religion. So one of the things I did think about with this, right, when I started this was, whoa, I got to be careful talking about politics. Like last night I covered a Trump rally, right? I was like, well, what if I actually file for a tax exemption, get it, and then they're like, hey, man, you, you, you did this Trump rally and you were trashing Donald Trump, right? As a tax-exempt atheist church, you're not supposed to be endorsing or talking against particular candidates, right? Like, I literally thought through that. I was like, whoa, like, does this mean, do I even want to do this? Because this means, this might mean I can't talk about politicians, right? But literally, after I saw Greg Locke and Steven Anderson, I was like, no, I'm doing this because that's exactly the point. It's to point out that they're doing it and they're getting away with it. And I'd be happy for you to tell me to stop doing that. Just go tell them the same thing. Right. You probably could say you probably could say you're being discriminated against. You could. Exactly. Because they didn't do it to all those other people who've been doing it for years. Why you? Why me? And it's the same thing you said with the tax exemption. I would love for them to go and say, no, 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 you guys can't be tax exempt anymore. Great. That's what we've been trying to say the whole time. Even the funny thing, like, uh, you know, somebody was explaining this to me. I think it was like No Name or Tux. Even the whole thing where we say like, oh, the flying man flied for your sins. And people go, well, you'd be crazy to believe that. Yes, that's the point of our religion. You're not (laughs) supposed to believe it, right? Like, it's just, I just, it's, but yeah, that's the funny thing. It's like all these things that come up, you're like, yes, that's the point we're trying to point out. Like, they shouldn't be tax exempt. I'd be happy to, for, for. You know, again, guys, this is a pipe dream. We're talking about a real pipe dream. But how amazing would that be if there was a rash of atheist churches being founded and all of a sudden the Christians and the Muslims start going, no, 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 we got to get rid of this tax exemption thing. We can't have these tax exempt atheist churches. I mean, we would just say, kill me now. I could die happy. Right. 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 I mean, it's the same way the Satanists have been doing it. They, they see Christians exploiting loopholes or testing the boundaries of law mm-hmm. in public schools. So the Satanists step up and say, okay, well, we want the same rights. We want to dis- distribute our literature to children, for example, and have um, special guest speakers from our church addressing children. Right. But the Christians would go, okay, never mind. We'll, we'll stop if you don't, Chris, this. We'll stop. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. And it's often effective, right? You think the next yeah. thing that's coming is the Satanist teacher who says, all right, students, we're going to do. All right, cool, cool. Everybody rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me get the, let me drop down the Satanist flash. All right, children, join me in my little Hail Satan first. Don't, don't, oh, we'll get to the Pledge of Allegiance. It's coming. Don't you worry, children. Just a little Hail Satan first, right? Again, that, that prayer in schools thing would be probably over before it started, right? It would be, yeah, it'd be it, real it, quick. Yeah. Um, now, James, in, in your in your view, what makes um, what makes an honorable uh, Christian or any any person of any faith? What what sort of behavior would you say makes them especially honorable? Where we could look at that person and go, now wait a second, look at what they're doing. You know, that's really impressive. Sure. So the way the guideline that I use is it, it relies heavily on non hypocritical uh, mm-hmm. as a virtue so don't be a hypocrite if you if you apply a certain standard to other people you have to apply it to yourself if that's mm-hmm. what they're doing if they're speaking with other people um as an equal and they're not talking down to you you're not some lost soul you're not morally inferior um they're not the moral authority in the room right if they're speaking with you as an equal um and and not infringing upon you in any way then that's you know, in terms of social interactions, that's where I say that's honorable, that's respectable, that's exactly where we need to be. Because mm-hmm. no matter how right, you know, two different people can both think that they, ha- with two different moral opinions on a point, can both mm-hmm. think that they have the morally superior p- opinion about that particular point, but they can still set that aside if they're mature people and speak with each other as 
equals to where nobody tries to to play any special card like I'm entitled to more respect for my opinion or my voice um, than you are. My mine should carry more weight than yours because I have a God behind me saying I, telling I, me to tell you these things. I totally agree. Hang on one sec. Uh, yeah, Scott, what what do you think that I'm being uh, dishonest about? I'm not I'm not quite sure. Uh, and yes, I do want eyes on my content. And if you want to know what my motivation is for that is, it's because people like my one black friend uh, give up their time and said, hey, Jay, we should do something. People like Scott Apperson uh, say, hey, Jay, I'm down to do hot program. I have viewers in, in, a, in a growing community and it's more fun and interactive for everybody if more people are involved. So yes, that is how you feed the YouTube algorithm. Uh, but yeah, I, there are very few things I am not willing to change my mind about. Matter of fact, uh, if you check the stream I did last night on Pocket Locker and Jay Bundy, I was on with some right wingers for hours and they were just schooling me on international stuff. And I was over here Googling stuff. I had no, I, I mean, they taught me a ton of stuff. I actually thought that was great, great, great fun. Um, sure. But um, I want to come back to something you guys started with. And, and the real reason that this, like, when I, when I like, uh, first read the beginning of this blog post, James, it just was like a dagger to me. Uh, and the thing was, you talked about maturing, right? That phrase mm -hmm. right there, people grow. I have sure. this latent theory that, for, that, that this is all, there's a, mat uh, a maturity thing that happens, right? That, that like for some of us, you start growing intellectually, you start questioning things. And I think what you're getting at for other people here, it's not that you're saying they're immature or they never grew up, but that as they grow, there's these other vulnerabilities or maybe other things hooking them. And so we don't all go through this process the same way. But that's how I feel now, right? Like there's, speak to that, because I think that's where you were going with this. So there are many different kinds of maturity. Right. And so it's like a Christian can be quite mature when it comes to work ethic, for example. Mm -hmm. They can be the person that shows up every day, does their job, and really shines on it because anything worth doing is worth doing right. So that's an example of a type of maturity they can very well have. Uh, but, but, but that's the reason why, as the, as the blog continues, I list different sentiments that they express that are reflective of some very specific types of lacked maturity. And if to kind of spoil it a bit, a spoiler alert to, to make a general point, what Christians say or what Muslims say when they're trying to get you to, um, to humor the worldview and their value system makes a whole lot more sense when you think of it in terms of an eight-year-old child who's trying to explain to you the relationship you're supposed to have with daddy. And so there, there are elements of their psychology that never outgrew the need to be parented, that never outgrew the need to be validated by someone other than themselves. So someone needs to set their boundaries for them. Somebody needs to tell them when they're doing a good job and kiss their boo-boos and pick them up and carry them when they can't carry through on their own. And so they're speaking to common human struggles that even atheists have. Yes. But, but, but the difference is that they're, they're pushing a narrative that, that looks back to the old childish wiring that we all start in life with because we don't have a choice. That is the dynamic we have with parents because we don't understand the world yet. We have right. to defer to that authority. Um, can't feed but, ourselves, so, can't use language right. yet. Right. So yeah. within within the context of actually being a child, that worldview makes perfect sense. It's absolutely Yes. Um, but the problem is when, when we have these religious narratives that say, you know what? Don't outgrow that wire and don't outgrow those needs that way of relate, looking at the world and relating to yourself and relating to others and relating to authority. Don't outgrow those things. Still feel like you need those things because, you know, then, then they'll tell you you're not qualified and you'll never be qualified to govern your own life, to own your own life, to, to, to govern your own journey, that those things belong to daddy. Yeah, my and, mom, like, friend, I was just going to ask you to get in and then uh, maybe we could look at yes. some more of this post. But, yeah, go ahead. Sure, sure. Okay. I want you to finish your point, James, there before I ask my question. Was there a little more you wanted to add there? That's it. That's it. For okay. Now. What you inspired me to, to uh, what you inspired me to ask is how do you view in light of what you just said, the difference, the, sorry, the f different functions of a book like the Bible and the function of the God itself in the thinking of the religious mind? So, I mean, Bible, starting with Genesis, um, they, they cast this, this fatherly figure 
um, through through that that child lens. Um, but the problem, the bigger problem, and that's certainly a huge problem by itself, even if that father figure had been written to be a, really an ideal healthy father, that would still be a problem uh, for people that aren't that are talked out of maturing beyond the need for him. But the second problem really comes with the fact that the Bible's God character, if you really think about it, checks off every single item on the list of narcissistic personality disorder <laughs> and psychopathy. Yeah. Every single item on the list. Yeah. Check, check, yeah. Check, check. So what what I think happened, I think that whoever wrote a lot of these stories in Genesis, that they themselves were a narcissist, a severe one, that they had a strange wow. relationship with their children. They so walked their way. Yeah. And so they were projecting mm-hmm. a values narrative that endorses their way of looking at the world and what they think should be the, the role of a child to the parent, a parent who had children for all the wrong reasons and who expects that their children should never outgrow them. And so they create this character, this God character that exemplifies that same ideal and way of thinking and that type of relationship. Um, so that what happens is that these religious narratives and these religious cultures, they see the idea of this figure within the mind. They plant it in there and they help it grow. They help it become this larger living entity within the psyche. So they're basically hijacking a part of your brain where they grow this God figure um, and, and it's unique for every person. Mm-hmm. And but people don't realize that because they use the same language when they talk about who God is and what God wants and all that stuff. They use the same words. And it sounds like they're all saying the same thing, but they're not. Because this figure that grows in the mind is unique to every person within whom it resides. A personal they, yes, so that's what, that's really what makes it personal because it's mm-hmm. built from their own personal life experiences and that the way they associate different words and concepts and emotions and values and it's it's built with those things as it grew up and so it's natural to them and he's he's real and he's alive and they feel that connection mm-hmm. well of course they do it's it's literally something that lives inside their own mind of course they feel it of course mm-hmm. he's real but they don't understand the way in which he's real versus not real yeah and i want to speak but, a little bit to this conversation that's happening in the in the chat um because, because you know, uh, we, we we Rebecca comes up a lot, right? And 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 I've been having I I've been jumping around with Rebecca a lot. Even the night before we interviewed her, right? I was kind of raging, right? Because I found her second channel, the Examining Evolution channel, right? And I was all like, "Oh, you're going hardcore anti-evolution. You're interviewing all these intelligent design scientists." And I mean, I was raging, like, "This is not okay, Rebecca." We can't be friends sure. if you're going to do this. Right. Sure. And then going in an interviewer the next day, I literally was outside walking my dog. And I was like, Jay, since you started this show, you have wanted to interview one person. There's been one theist at the top of your list, you know, and that person is Rebecca. And mm-hmm. um, you've known from day one before you even knew she had a channel. Right. Because first I just saw her popping up on atheist, other atheists. I didn't know she had a channel before I knew she uh, had a channel. I knew she was a young earth creationist. So is it really Rebecca acting out of character or is Jason just being emotional, right? Jason's is being emotional to discovering something he should have already knew. If this person makes content, this is probably what it's going to look like, right? I always say this, theists are going to theist, apologists going to apologize. And yeah. so I do go back and <laughs> forth on how genuine is this person being, how honest is that person being. I think that that's probably a natural part of reacting to this. But look, I did the interview with her. She was absolutely wonderful. She was, you could speak to this, my one black friend. She was super fun to deal with. Cool Mm -hmm. as a cucumber. Great broadcaster. Um, And I feel like to speak directly to the issue, one, I don't know if a person's always being honest and forthright. But I love this comment that as anti-theists, part of what we do is we figure out you know, where we think they might be dishonest or how they're not taking the most honest position, what the motivations might be and how we can address it. And you have to remember, from my perspective, none of this is honest. Right. So when I'm talking to my mother about religion, to me, she's taking an inherently dishonest position. When I'm talking to my grandmother about this, she is taking an inherently dishonest position. So. Yeah, I just think that that's a fact of life of how you're going to feel. But here's the flip side that we have to remember. They do the same thing with us, right? 
when I'm talking to my Christian and my theist friends, they think atheism is the worst idea you could possibly have and will literally condemn you to an eternity of suffering. I don't just believe in evolutionary biology. I spent 10 years in grad school studying evolutionary biology, and I'll spend the rest of my life underpaid as an evolutionary biologist. To most Christians, that is the most irrational, financially stupid, and ridiculous life decisions you can make, but they're still willing to talk to me, right? So just as crazy as we think they are, just as I heard a guy yesterday on a, a theist say this on a stream, he said, you know, you got to be careful with these scientists, but you definitely not, cannot trust anything that is said by a scientist whose research is funded by the government. Right. I popped up on the stream three minutes later. I was like, hi, I'm an evolutionary biologist whose research is paid for by the government. And all I do is indoctrinate children at the university with NSF money like that's the world we live in. So I'm just saying, folks, like they're giving us the same benefit of the doubt that we're giving them. And I just think it just it's all it's all part of it. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Rebecca went on Sal's channel the other night and he, and they went live. And I think it probably should have been a private conversation because he was ba she was basically saying, well, can I get an amen, Kenny? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, can I get an amen? I love her that so much. So she was he was schooling her. She's like, well, what if an evolutionist says that? And then Sal was like, well, say this. And a lot of it was conversation stoppers. And some of it was just appeals to authority and lots of logical fallacies. And um you know, but he was trying to help her shortcut her way through the process because she doesn't understand the science and she knows she doesn't. And I think that that's just foolish, even if they're correct, even for the sake of argument, let's say evolution turned out to be false, just for the sake of argument. Sure, sure. It's still it's it, it's still silly for for somebody who admittedly doesn't know enough about the science to start preparing to debate it on their channel. Like, come on, like. I'm on the evolution side of it. And once I get my channel going, I'm not going to debate with people about evolution because I'm not qualified. There's just so many people out there that are. Let them handle that one, and I'll stay in my own wheelhouse. I'm going to be honest with you. I do evolutionary biology every day for a living, and I don't feel qualified to debate it, right? Because there's so much cellular stuff. There's so much molecular stuff. I got news for you guys. I just spent 10 years in grad school, and you know what it means to most of the people in my field? Jack shit, absolutely nothing. Why? Because everybody has a PhD, right? The last 10 years I spent in grad school, they spent that 10 years in the field, working, teaching, publishing papers, giving conference talks. So we're babies, right? If you just got your PhD in a field, I know to most of the world that makes you like a huge expert and you're qualified now. No, 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 no. To most of the people in the field, that's like, oh, great. Well, look at you, new to the dance. Welcome. Here's your admission ticket. You can enter the park now. You've start accomplished working. absolutely nothing. Right. It's yeah, a ticket start to start working. You've earned nothing. So literally, I, the, you know, right, for me, I'm like, I'm like, no, why don't you get somebody who's been doing this for 20 years or, or 30 years? Why, why would you ask me? I just, got, I just finished school, right? Like, it's like student Dr. Ben. He's like, he's like, I'm still a student, guys. I'm telling you all this, but I'm still a student, right? Like... <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. The other thing I wanted to speak to about this, and uh, I want to thank Lena because she brought this to my attention um, and, and helped me really think about it. Somebody like Rebecca has taken on a lot of personal risk. Uh, you know, like when she moved her content more to like being atheist friendly, that cost her a lot of her Christian viewership from what I hear and, and how I understand, even when she tells this story, right? So... Mm -hmm. Even to the point, because I'm, I'm with you. I think there's a lot of hubris involved in all this. How do you have the audacity to uh, put up a whole channel opposing a science and then not genuinely study the science enough to learn it and understand it? I find that to just be dishonest and arrogant and all of that. But, but the flip side, when you are having these conversations and, you're, and you are taking on both sides, even on the Examining Evolution channel, y'all, she will have evolutionary biologists on there, right, who are basically telling her she's wrong and explaining the evolutionary biologist, biology to her properly, right? So you got to give credit where credit is due. She is doing that. And again, it comes at tremendous risk. A lot of the apologists, you know, especially the more fundamental ones, they would never make that type of content on their channel. Just saying. James, I, I think you would agree. 
uh, what we all learn from studying religion, the best way to keep them coming back is to get them angry. And keep That's them true. Alive. So for you, uh, Pocket Locker, you're screwed. You're watching that channel forever. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're going to exactly. be there forever. <laughs> yep. She sure got gotcha. you. She got gotcha. you. Uh, you guys want to read some more of this post? This post, I think it's really uh, great. Well, uh, Go ahead. I, I have, I have a question. Um, by the way, I, uh, if you don't mind, James, I'm going to wait on my question. B.S. Lewis has a comment that I, I'd love for you to speak to, because uh, maybe you have some insight on uh, the B.S. Lewis situation. The comment says, "I'm married to a Christian, and that seems to give one a perspective that others who are free to shut doors on Christians' faces don't have." So. Okay, so B.S. Lewis is in a really, in a marriage with a Christian and can't just, I guess, when B.S. is hearing the opposing point of view, shall we say, B.S. just can't walk away. They have to stay there and be present. Uh, could you talk to maybe how other people can navigate that or even maybe some advice for B.S., how B.S. can navigate that? Well, absolutely. I mean, he's speaking to the to the value of not being in an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, amen. It's not, amen. It's not, it's not just Christians that do that. I see atheists do that all the time. They get sucked into the echo chamber, and they're not thinking beyond the parameters. They're not free to. And it's not that atheists are, are wrong about a lot of their arguments. Their arguments are solid. But... I have seen some overpolarization where people are a bit too critical of believers and a bit too mm -hmm. rigid about their interpretation of what's going on over there in the believer camps and in the believers' hearts and minds, et cetera. And yeah, absolutely. I think I think he's on to something because it, it, it kind of reminds me of um Spurlock. Was his name Mike or Matt Spurlock? He had a he had an HBO special called 30 Days. Oh Morgan. And Morgan Spurlock, that's what mm -hmm. it was. Thank you. And what it was, he would take people who were polarized opposites in their worldviews and value system, and he'd, put, and he'd have them live together for 30 days. But there was there was some oversight, so it didn't all go to hell and, and people, you know, murdering each other or whatever. And at the end of the 30 days, what you would find is that people, um, that, that both sets of people that were put together had their views tempered by a greater understanding mm -hmm. of the other person and the other culture, the other way of thinking, the other way of living. And he was really on to something because I think that some implementation of that is going to be absolutely essential to humanity moving forward because we've got to yes. be able to have less polarized discussions and get to see each other pe as, as real people and understand that, that it's not as simple as it seems from a distance. Yeah. I also well, didn't go ahead. Okay, thank thank you. How do you how do you listen when you want to speak? Follow me. If if the other person is so anxious to get out their point of view, and it's one that is just sort of maybe they're trying to nicely uh, tear us down, let's say, right? Sure. How do you listen when you want to speak? I think that the first thing that happens is you you, you need to depolarize the um the sentimentality the mentality of of the persons that are involved mm -hmm. if, if if once they begin to see each other as relatable human beings and where it's not a contest and your way of life isn't in jeopardy and they're not the enemy once you really once you ease into a different kind of energy between you and the other person it mm -hmm. becomes easier to be patient and you begin to hear them out and you begin to actually really hear what they're saying even if they're wrong you begin yeah. to understand the nuances behind what they're thinking. i'm gonna i'm gonna say like the other day i did a broadcast where i was criticizing um genetically modified skeptic right because he was talking about how we still love jesus but he won't worship him right uh, mm -hmm. And I was being a complete hypocrite because I was basically criticizing him for still being like culturally Christian and hanging on to his love of Christian culture and ideals or whatever. And uh, I just want to say, first of all, hypocrisy is fun and part of the human experience. So I don't ever claim I'm not a hypocrite. I'll just tell you flat out when I'm being hypocritical. It's, it's a good time. Also, sometimes sure. I'm trying to be entertaining. Right. And who cares? Like, I, I don't use my channel virtue signal. But not always. But um, wasn't that virtue signal? Yeah, it was virtue. So I was gonna say whatever. Right but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, hypocrisy is fun, my one black friend. It's sure. fun. Do as I say, not as I do. Um, sure. But sure. part of what I want to speak to is my love of being a part of a church as an atheist, 
And um, part of what I think you're speaking to about being in this marriage is part of what I love about that is I believe if I want to talk to people about my atheism and I want to share my lack of faith with them and I want to influence with them, if I'm being a genuine person trying to be a little bit less hypocritical, I should let them influence me. And so one of the things I love about being an atheist worship drummer is it constantly gives people a chance to evangelize me. And I think that's perfect. Because again, if I want to talk to you about evolution or point out little holes in the gospel, then why can't I let them tell me about the love of Jesus or why atheism is going to lead me to hell or why, you know, right. this is all uh, God working in my life so he could bring me uh, to greater utility in his kingdom. Lay it on me, you know, and I think a lot of us in this community, like, you got to accept that. You're out here trying to have this conversation. Don't make it a one-way conversation. And so right. I think being in that marriage, like, makes you sharp the same way I think it does for Doug and people like that. Because you see the other side as human. You, you, you learn how to work through things. And so uh, I've learned that even last night when I'm talking about being with these conservative guys, I mean this seriously. Like, it was super fun because I love range. I love being dynamic. I love giving you a little bit of different. Right. So we spent a couple hours just having fun with the Trump rally, goofing off you know, uh, lock her up, lock her up. That's always what we're looking for when we do the Trump rally, right? But when I mm -hmm. talked to these guys later, it was like, I don't know, 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever, uh, these dudes were telling me about the, the crisis with diesel and the shortages and how the economic sanctions that we're levying against Russia are complicating uh, the world's economic stage and, you know, uh, dangling us on this knife edge of, of another world war. And YouTube Punk is, like, sending me links. Yeah, YouTube Punk, DEF, they were, I was, like, sending, they were sending me links. I was having to look stuff up and being like, hey, guys, this is really informative. But here's my point. How the heck can we influence them if we're not willing to listen and be influenced? So I loved right. it because all of this culture war stuff, all of this, let's fight about CRT and Roe v. Wade and, uh, you know, uh, them transgendering your kids. Like a lot of that is masking and it's covering up these other real nuanced differences of, of opinion we have about substantive issues that aren't actually all one way or the other. We can actually learn a lot from each other. And I recognize these dudes are not ignorant. They're well-read. They're well-studied. And they're actually citizens of the world. They might lean a little MAGA. You know, they might think no matter how bad Trump is, Joe Biden's worse. But you know what? I had to really respect them. And I got news for you guys as a, as a, as a proper scholar. I'm lazy. I'm lazy. What do I mean by that? I do one type of research, the type you pay me to do, evolutionary biology. What do these people do? They go do their jobs as whatever the fuck they do for a living. And then they come home and they do scholarship in their spare time. You know, they're studying and they're reading the books and they're staying up on the... I'm not doing any of that. So honestly, respect, right? Like, respect to you for working hard in your spare time to stay up on what's going in the world and then welcome a little liberal snowflake like me onto your channel and school me. Like, we got to give each other that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, James, how would you say in the... Uh going back to your blog, but riffing off what uh, Pocket Locker just said, what is the best way to be an active listener and make the, the difficult conversations between the believer and the non-believer a win for both? Um, where even, let, let's just turn the wick up on this, even a hostile non-believer, even a hostile believer, is, sure. is there a way to win that conversation? Well, you have to disarm the spirit of hostility first. Mm -hmm. You have to reframe the conversation so that it's not such that their ego is riding on it, is, is being bet on it. Like, mm, powerful. You yeah. know, yeah, they, if they feel like that's like they, who they are or the value of who they are is under attack, if, that, if they feel like that's what's being questioned, then mm -hmm. anything you say is going to be seen in that light. So you have to make sure that, that you convey and make sure that within yourself you actually are coming at it genuinely from the perspective of you just want to understand them and in an exchange yes. you're hoping that they could better understand you 
And if, and if it's, that's the narrative, and if that's the way that we phrase every sentence that then flows from our, our mouth in the discussion um, mm -hmm. and make sure that our, that, that our tone, if it's an audible discussion, matches that spirit of things, we can, we can bring them back down to just, you know, to have a more civil discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm inspired to ask you, and, and this may be a, a, a question we should ask believers when we speak to them in the future. Uh, what do we, when we, I left religion, what did I lose when I left? Are you asking me? I'm asking you, yeah. Or so, more importantly, that and what do you think the average person that you've encountered would say I lost? See, it's interesting that you ask me that because on one hand, I'm remembering when Penn, Penn Gillette said that the reason he doesn't, um, if he could have some ironclad arg argument that would always convert a theist every time into atheism. He'd never, he wouldn't be afraid to use that argument because he wouldn't want the responsibility um, of pulling that rug out from underneath them because what if they needed it? What if they weren't ready for that awakening and mm -hmm. it just threw them into chaos in existential crisis in depression? And in theory, that could happen. Um, but at True. the same time, every... Every deconverted atheist that I've ever encountered beyond like a two year window of adjustment has been glad for the deconversion. There, there's often a time where they regret it. They wish they could almost like going back into the womb. Oh, they I've seen it. Yeah. 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 Um, but eventually they get past that. And when they mm -hmm. do, um, they begin to take ownership of their own life, their journey, their feelings, their sexuality, everything else. And without undue shame and, it's so liberating and so empowering, especially if they're connected with the community, which is, again, very important, like you were saying. Um, so they don't feel like they're all alone in the fight, right? Um, mm -hmm. They end up on the other side of it, um, and it becomes restorative. It becomes healing. It becomes empowering. But there's that window of time where they, where they can't see that light at the end of the tunnel, and they just aren't sure how to make sense of life or make sense of themselves. And um, that's a, tur you know, a turbulent period of time for for some people. So is so the question is, is there ever somebody who deconverts, um, who ends up perpetually regretting it and never recovers? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that 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 not, if I knew for sure, that would empower me to give you a much more comprehensive answer. Here's it, a, a, a slightly different question. And then I want to get to Cameron's comment. Um, do you think I, I agree with you? I actually think like uh, part of the reason I, I'm I'm more committed to ever that to actively say, hey, I'm I'm totally down to deconvert people, right? And I think it's a good idea to do so. Is because I really do believe there's like this freedom and this celebration, and it, it's a lot of benefits. So I don't know anybody that regrets it perpetually. But do yeah, you think that underlying there's that fear, right? That 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 there's like, even for people who are questioning, that there's this fear that if I go through, follow through on this questioning, I'll, I'll end up somewhere I regret. Sure. I mean, it's one of the biggest reasons they won't question it. They won't, you know, they, they do these thought stopping exercises and these conversation stopping exercises and they throw up um, mental barriers to stop you from getting yeah. through, specifically because they're worried about that and they don't want to risk it. Um, are there... If, there, if we notice we're falling into a conversation that's that, oh, wait, well, that's the you, you're there. wrong because you don't believe that sort of thing uh, with with uh, with the believer, what are some things we can do to sort of set the stage? Um, I feel like I'm re-asking a question that you answered beautifully a moment ago. I guess, um, would you say we're better off for having the conversation or just or just politely stating, I realize this may be very important to you, but it's nothing I want to discuss. So for me, I, I always want to discuss it. Like me I have to be, yeah. <laughs> not I, everyone will, though. Sure, sure, sure. So I mean, I would encourage anybody who's not familiar with it to go research the Socratic method. Um, if you can be more question focused than than statement focused, and mm -hmm. if you can get if you can get people to ask themselves the important questions. Um, that they never really thought about before. They didn't think through fully before. Um, they they might surprise themselves with coming up with uh, 
with questions and interest that they didn't have before. Sorry, guys. And I um, I accidentally uh, dropped the stream key. But the link I just dropped, the studio.restream.io, guest, all that, blah, blah, blah. That's the uh, call-in link if you guys want to call in and talk to James. Uh, we like to make sure we have a good period of time to, uh, you know, interview our guests ourselves. But uh, I want to open it up if uh, you guys want to want to join the conversation. Um, go ahead, James. Didn't mean to cut you off. Just wanted to mention that. I mean... That's the first. That's my answer for now. But if you want to. OK. Me also, um, I wanted to get to uh, Cameron's uh, comment. He said we needed James during the stream with Christians the other night, which was uh, we joined him with some uh, boisterous, boisterous Christians who wanted to speak to us. But, yeah, man, I wanted to say, you know, like uh, I definitely love having you and I'd, I'd love for you to, you know, have a more formal role in, 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 in the community here and in, in what we're doing. I definitely try to elevate people to. Uh, you know, we kind of call our mods ushers and then they move into deacons, but uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, and so maybe we'll chat in Discord after this uh, and, uh, and and see where things go. But uh, yeah, I've uh, I've always en enjoyed our conversation and I do think you would have been helpful because I like the fact that uh, there's a diversity of atheists, right? And, and we've got some people that are really in your face and uh, some other people that are really friendly. We've got my one black friend, our resident. Uh, you know, there's always that one guy in a crew who's way too nice. Uh, <laughs> but no, that's uh, it's it, it's really helpful uh, for all the panel, though. Cameron also asked, do y'all think uh, having these convos with Rebecca has any benefit and why? Uh, I'll start by saying I often got to a place where I thought they were going nowhere and I started to get frustrated. And part of that was I realized the sort of treasure of education. And what I mean by that is I have seen students start at a place that I think I could call Rebecca-like in their mentality, sort of the college version of it. They're actively in a church and they're part of a worship group or whatever, and they come in my class and they're eh, on evolution, right? But you hear as part of the curriculum, and when they come out, they're enthused about evolution, probably still in their church, but they really got it now. They're definitely not anti-evolution, and they're just off to the races, and I love it. And it's the difference that that 15 weeks with me and Rob has made in their life, right? And what I see with a lot of these content creators is you got world-class experts just on your, on your channel, for, for month in and month out. Okay, Rebecca, let me walk you through the fossil record now. Let's talk about geology, right? You've got Rebecca, uh, uh, Gutsick Gibbon, and all the, the philosophers and all that. And, and it's just, and it seems like for these people, it's just going in one ear and out the other. And then they go, well, well, I've had the scientist on. I've heard them out. I'm totally unconvinced, but thanks for showing up. Uh, drop your super chats below. See you later. You know, and I was just like, this is ridiculous. Right. And it's because sure. you're wasting that education. You know, people would kill to have an opportunity to get educated by these people. And they are giving you one on one private tutoring in public benefits of comment section and all of this. And, and y'all don't care. Um, but I also realized. Just like I think, Doug, if you saw his debate with Trent Horn. The brilliant thing he did was he talked past Trent Horn and used it as an opportunity to talk to Trent Horn's audience who might be new. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is uh, sometimes you're trying to get a pebble up a hill, and that's maybe what my students are. They're in learning mode. They're about to go to med school. They're really quick studies, right? And so they're like getting a pebble up a hill. You can actually just take it. Few few weeks with me and Rob, just we just chuck it on up the hill and it's easy, right? Other times you're trying to push a fucking boulder up a hill, and it takes a lot longer to push that boulder up the hill. And actually, you know what? I can't push it up by myself. Uh, you know what? Maybe even me and Rob, Rob, Rob can't get it up himself either. Maybe it takes right. Maybe it takes the village to raise this child, <laughs> right? And and maybe it's just gonna take a decade to get her up that hill as opposed to 10 weeks. You know, I, I don't know, but that's, that's my take. What do you guys think? Sure. James, you want to go ahead and take it? Well, I mean, you know, all we can do is plant seeds and 
try to nurture them along the way. Whatever grows, grows. We have to accept our limits, make peace with our limits, and make peace with the people that whose limits frustrate us. Just to let it let it be, because it's it's all physics at the end of the day, and um, you know they're they're just everybody's journey is their own. They are where they are. They're making as much sense of it as they can. Whatever's in the way is just in the way. All we can do is offer whatever help that we have. And some people will make a lot of use of that and some people won't. And that's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. I guess um, for myself, Cameron, that the thing, why it's beneficial, I've learned in my life that I'm unexpected, unexpectedly a teacher at times. And I've seen how valuable that has been to literally hundreds of people. And knowing that a chance to talk to Rebecca and people like Rebecca, I, I value it greatly because there's a person and she may see it the same way as I do. And uh, in fact, a lot of people may. Here's a person who doesn't understand things in the way that I understand them. They may be missing a piece of knowledge that I have. I may be missing knowledge uh, that they have. If we fail to have that conversation in a civil way, we may not ever be able to help each other along. If we can have that conversation in a civil way, we can grow. Sure. As James totally. has pointed out, we can maintain our disagreement. We can walk away with that still. But at least we have something more. Uh, James, I don't know if you saw the interview with Rebecca that we did, but hmm? I had a question about hey, and for the benefit of anyone else who didn't see it, um, I had uh, asked her about if she had a time machine and she can go back and see Jesus um, and they could understand each other. What are some, you know, I think I phrased this, what would you ask him to say? Like, make sure you comment on this. And she made a comment about, I know what I wouldn't want him to say. There was something she didn't want him to say. And it was about how, you should sell your cloak and go and buy a sword. Now, I have a lot of fun with this Bible. I point because I have it on my screen here. Uh, I have a lot of fun with it because it's a target rich environment, as one movie put it, um, about women, though. But uh, I explained to her that's not a bad thing that he says that. And I went on to explain its origins are in the Old Testament. And the reason why he's telling that person to sell your cloak and buy a sword is it's part of the Passover ritual that you're supposed to gird yourself. You're supposed to put on a sword, right, as part of the ritual where he is telling these people they've gathered for the benefit of their salvation. Not to beat up on somebody, not to defend him by using uh, a metal sword or something like that, but to gather and save themselves for pe from perishing in the second death, that sort of thing. There's the value. This now, is uh, this is Jesus, the uh, minister of the ritual, not Jesus, the warrior prince. Yeah, not not the guy in Revelation who's yeah, coming yeah. back to, to, to beat up on on me and uh, the uh, fellow non-believers. So. Right, right. Um, but yeah, the meek and mild Jesus with a with a fairly good point about his mission. Right, he's being about his mission. And so, and you don't uh, even for, believe Jesus existed. No, he didn't exist. In <laughs> um, but for her, because her faith is what dear to her, and I'm putting forth, I'm, I'm, I'm literally giving her back her faith. Here, you thought there was a blemish on it. No, 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 no. Let me polish that for you and explain to you what you truly had in that one aspect. Uh, it may be later that some other opinions I have are now worth listening to because she can fact check me. She can go back in the Old Testament and see it's exactly what I said it was. And she trusts and so, you. She knows you're not looking to straw man the Bible. Yeah, absolutely not. Believe me, I could never do a better job. <laughs> than it yeah, right. To itself. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so it's, it's, to me, it's, it's comedy more than it's poetry, quite honestly. Well, but sure, I even in a moment, an atheist defending Jesus to a Christian, this is, is itself funny. 
And so it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I want to uh, get to uh, something Cameron had asked, which is, do we feel the same way about other Christians? And he had mentioned some names in particular, uh, Darth Dawkins, Rob, Kenny. And I'm just going to say for myself, there's a number of different motivations. So some of these things, I want to check stuff off my bucket list. As a YouTuber in this community, Darth Dawkins is a known entity. I personally think he's a jerk. My conversations with him, I imagine it would be very different than a lot of other people. But here's the thing. It's Darth Dawkins, right? And I happen to have a colleague named Cliff who I'm going to start doing broadcasts with. I should be streaming with Cliff tomorrow afternoon. He's the developer of the digital evolution software I use called Mabe. But he also is into this community. I didn't know this is one of those things you, you realize you have a mutual kind of interest with a colleague, right? And so he watches Darth Dawkins. He can't stand Darth Dawkins, right? So if I get an invitation to debate or have a conversation with Darth Dawkins, I'm taking it every time. Because it's an opportunity to grow my community and my channel that I just can't afford to say no to. And if I can bring Cliff with me, and then him and I can show up the next Monday and, and, and I can kick back and we can talk about the conversation Cliff actually had with Darth Dawkins. Like, I'm, as a buddy, I'm checking that off. My, I was a good buddy today and, and we and Cliff just did something that was fun, right? Is Cliff going to end up just in a shouting match with Darth Dawkins? It's going to be a complete dumpster fire <laughs> and, and it's not going to be productive at all? Absolutely, but it's Darth Dawkins, right? When you have somebody like Kenny, you know, I don't think Kenny's one of those guys who, you know, pretends to be some kind of super apologist or whatever, but I know he's got a YouTube channel. At the same time, I find Kenny to just be a kind of honest, genuine guy. I think he's a good conversation. I think he's fun. I think he's willing to play along. You know, I was yeah. I jumped over the other night. I gave him, you know, three or four, can I get amen, Kenny? And every time he gave, he gave me an amen and laugh with me, hey, Kenny's good in my book. And, and the opportunity, I want to interview, like, Mike, I actually wanted, I jumped on just to get his email just so I could get him on Hot Program, right? And, and so I could do something with Kenny. Because I think his perspective very much represents a lot of Christians. And when you talk mm -hmm. to Kenny, to me, you're talking to a real Christian. And, and, what, and what I mean is my background as a believer, which that means, like, you're not a Sunday Christian. You're what I call a every single Monday through Saturday Christian. You go to the church. The church is a huge part of your life. Church people are a huge part of Look, for a lot of you guys that, you know, you believe in Jesus in private and you read the Bible on your own and you pray to God in your room, look, you are a real Christian, okay? That's just not the type of folks I, got, I grew up with. You see what I'm saying? So, Kenny's that's thing. Rob... I don't care about being productive. Sometimes I just need some stuff is for me and my mental health and for my community and my friends. You guys are my friends. I love you. I just need to keep it real with you. Rob is my least favorite content creator on the internet. I, I don't, look, the, what I'm about to say is very serious. You should never say what I'm about to say to a content creator. It's the meanest thing you could ever say to somebody and it's awful. But I think Rob should delete his channel. I literally am so angry about the time I've spent listening to Rob bore me and look up obscure cherry pick citations. I want him to delete his channel. Now, is that nice of me or productive or in any shape or way going to lead to anything improductive in the world? Absolutely not. But it's just how I feel about Rob. I'm going to let you guys take it over from here. I mean, we're talking about the same, the same Rob I clash with, right? That same Rob. Uh, yeah. What's what's the name of his channel? So people know which channel they should never watch. You gotta warn them. Put this on your blacklist of channels. I don't even know the name of it. You'll I can't. be a viewer forever. You're, he's got you angry, so he's got you. <laughs> oh, I don't watch. No, you can't. I, you can't. It, it'll put you to sleep. He's he's that bad. He's just he can't create good content. Uh, but go ahead. Go ahead, James. Go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead, James. So I mean, in the comments section on on Rebe Rebecca's channel, like Sentinel. I like. What is it? Sentinel, Sentinel something. Apologetics. Sentinel apologetics. Oh, put it on your to be deleted list. Sure. So I, I did a walkthrough on her channel as a comment about a bunch of different stunts that Rob pulls when, in these debates and discussions. And like almost everything he says is just a stunt. He's just trying to cheat his way to a sense of victory um, while overprotecting his ego the entire time. And it's so unproductive. Um, I'm not saying that I'm trying to summarize the whole of who he is. Right. Because I'm not. I don't know the whole of who he is. But in that context, his behaviors are certainly not accurate. So, so uh, is Rob is Rob the guy who sort of sounds like this? 
Yes, oh yes. yeah, okay. you know yeah. what we're talking about. Okay, I know who you're talking oh, about. Oh my god. I heard oh. I heard a little bit of him the other day. And can you tell me, does he constantly reinforce the idea? Also, my one black friend, you're no longer allowed to do uh Rob impressions. Because literally, no, 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 because your impression of him was actually <laughs> Uh, so much more entertaining than he is. That is too much of a compliment. So no more Rob oh, impressions. Okay. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, because you're 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 Alan making Carr him you're making him Alan you're making Carr. him seem better than he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't <Okay>. do that. <laughs> I shall not shine a light where darkness prevails. Exactly. <laughs> um, I I think Rob in the bit that I heard him, he seemed to lean too much on the idea of the magi being a very good reason to buy into the entire Jesus narrative. I think there's some there's some things there he ought to know. He and I haven't had a conversation. But I think it's more plain than it is miraculous. It's, it's actually very simple. Um, once you realize what a star is, that a star is an angel, is a messenger, it's the same thing. Yes, a star can mean a star in the sky. Um, but often back then they might have interpreted a planet as a star. But, you know, uh, I think he relies too much on that. There are things he doesn't know that could kind of disabuse him of that opinion. But as you've stated here, James, in your blog, there are reasons people keep those opinions. There are reasons they hold on. Mm -hmm. Um even when they know they're wrong. So I think uh, the value of being corrected, be it me or someone who is a, not, uh, who is a believer, I think should be appreciated. To have someone care for you enough, even if you're a stranger, to sort of put you on the right understanding is very valuable because even if you still disagree, at least you understand a little bit more and maybe you can even make a better argument sure. regardless of which side you're on. Yeah. Also, like, I just feel too, like, just make content. Just make content and tell us what you think. That's what Rob is what, doing. What I think, no, but here's what I think a lot of people do. They draw attention to their weaknesses in a certain way, right? If my name was Pocket Locker and then I had this thing in my bot where you could, where you could, hang on a second. Let me show you guys so you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I could do this name thing, right? And, and the bot will tell you this is what my name means. And it'll show you like it's, it's a drumming reference, right? If I did that and then I was just absolutely awful at drumming, right? Y'all would be like, you know, just, just call your channel Jay Bundy maybe or just uh, interesting science guy talks, right? So, so my point is, when you draw it and all you talk about is, look how good I am as a scholar. Well, these people don't know what they're talking about because they don't understand the proper scholarship. They're not as scholastically sophisticated as I am. And then you just cherry pick scholarship from the worst journals and you do like really bad scholar. People like me just sit back and go, well, man, this is just like really bad scholarship, and you didn't have to draw my attention to how particularly awful your scholarship is by bragging about how brilliant you are all the time, right? And that's sure. what drives me. Like, I, I realize, like, and I want to compare it to somebody like Richard Madsen, right, who I uh, kind of thought was like, a, like an atheist maybe or something like that when I first heard of him and then I listened to his channel and I realized he's kind of not I think he's like a theist and he's got some really interesting ideas I think they're kind of out there I don't really believe them much right I don't know so you probably disagree about a whole lot but he's super friendly really charismatic you love having him in your chat I hope he comes on I'd love to have him on our program and if you watch his channel he's engaging he's interesting he's fun to talk to you're like go Richard Madsen I'm all about this guy Rob is like dry, boring. Every time James, you ask him a question, he goes, uh, hang on, hang on a sec. And he sits there and types away for like four minutes while he looks up a ref. Right? It's just like, it's just the worst to me. Just really bad. Sure. Now, in Rob's, one thing I will say for Rob is that I think he is smart. I think he's so smart that he outsmarts himself. And I've said this before. Mm. Um, it's, it's the idea of finding patterns where there aren't any finding meaning where there where there isn't any um which which really underpins the 
the um, like um, Jewish mysticism, like Kabbalah and numerology and things mm. like that. So these people are so clever that they're looking for things that other people won't notice in order to prove how clever they are. And of course, when you're looking for a pattern, a correlative pattern, you'll find one you even find if it. it's not there. Mm -hmm. And that's what he does. And he doesn't realize he's found something that isn't there. So he's he's smart, but he's smart in ways that he outsmarts himself. And I find it mildly amusing, but he's also, yes, very frustrating. To <laughs> now, James, I heard you in an interview with Otangelo, or maybe it was a debate. Maybe it was, I don't know. You'll remember if it was. I was on Otangelo's channel once. Okay. And you mentioned, uh, you made a comment about the correlation, possible correlation maybe between being a drummer as a youth and intelligence. Do you recall that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Were you a drummer as well? Uh, when I was younger, I was. That's I did, great. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't so, know that. There we okay, go. That's all three of us. That's oh, all three really? Of us. Yeah, awesome. keep the yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking about getting back into that lately. I really have been. I think you should do it. Know. Do it. Do it. Everybody should play drums. I don't know. It's just my motto. Do yeah, it. So James. I... James. Just do it. Yeah. You know how this yeah, is. I always joke. It. Everybody plays. Uh, everybody wants to be a drummer, but nobody wants to play drums. Right. Because sure. it's <laughs> like, you know, you love the idea of being on stage and rocking out or whatever. But the difference between is that that guy plays drums. He just he's at home just practicing and playing drums. So just do it. I'm going to just yeah. keep bothering you till you tell me you're All drumming right. again. You do that. You do that. I'm, I want you to. OK. Awesome. That works. Definitely. You too, my one black friend. You need to, because look, my dad used to be a drummer, and I realized what I'm going to have to do is make a bunch of money, enough that I can buy him a really nice drum set. I'm going to have to get it for him for Christmas, put it in his home, set it up, and then guilt trip him until he feels awful about not using it and actually sits down at the thing and makes me a video. I I should have done the same thing. My dad was a drummer when, when I was a kid and when I was little, and he didn't stick with it either. And I always knew that he was missing something. I always knew he should have went back to it. And yeah. I should have bought him a set. I should have bought him a set and did exactly what you just said. I wish I had. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's the plan. Yeah, as soon as it's in the budget. But yeah, actually, I appreciate the encouragement. Uh, thank you. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot to take in, and uh, I think m music is great, and I also think there's something to the discipline, like it teaches you how to just, uh, it, it, it sort of undermines magical thinking in, an, in, in its own way, right? Everything starts from nothing. You've got to like learn the patterns and sit there and focus on the stickings and the balance and the coordination and, and all of that it takes sure. to even play a song you realize oh there's no magic in this at all it was just me in that room and my goofy limbs trying right. to get it right and then there's another layer to it and the world science festival had a whole series on this a few years ago where they had these um tests where they would have primates uh, monkeys apes different kinds of primates exposed to certain kinds of beat patterns and then they eventually had them work manually with uh, little visual and physical puzzles. And they found that the, the primates that were exposed to certain kinds of beat patterns with, with drums um, became more intelligent over time. Uh, mm. it, it just, it, it, they, they aren't 100% understanding exactly how that works yet but. yeah because it's not drums right there there can't be like um there's no there, and this kind of shows that sure. right there's all this different phenomenon that is doing something sure. in the brain and drumming right. activates it right yeah yeah right actually yeah. i think that's that might be it yeah. yeah i think the the different certain types of cadences james i think they get your mind sort of unfocused on sure. things that would be distractions Right. And so the things that you're supposed to focus on become easy. Would you look at these uh, tribal cultures like in, uh, I don't know, Central America, South America, Asia, Africa, when they get together and have some festival, what are they doing? They're drumming. Mm -hmm. And then people sort of get lost in it. And it's like a yeah. trans like a trans like yeah. thing. Yes. A trans like yeah. thing. Right. For them. And then whatever yeah. the celebration continues in there. That's very I, I love uh, it. Going going yeah. back to the to uh, say the basics, um, because you're enculturated as a small child. You're going to be part of that one day. I part of that dancing and all that stuff. And so you yeah. focus on it and you'll learn it. But I, I think uh, you probably could play it for students. Some things they'll get lost and how the drums sound. And what do, we, what do you see a lot of kids doing? Oh, yeah. They're doing this, they're yeah. playing air guitar. Yeah, yeah. 
you don't see many air yeah. singers, I guess. That, I'll tell you guys, for me, like, it there. started at the church, right? And my grandfather now happens to be the pastor of the, the church that, you know, but he wasn't. He was the assistant pastor. And for me, it was like, it used to be wall-to-wall people in the cathedral, and everybody was just rocking out with the drummer, and uh, there was always, like, that's where the kids wanted to sit. And so I would sit in the front, like, the very front pew, like right by the drum so I could just front row seat see the whole thing and eventually what they do is they give you like a cowbell or something right and then you're like that annoying kid in church who's like jamming along to the drummer with the cowbell and stuff like that and they start showing you stuff which is why when I played at drums anytime I'd see a kid there I'd always encourage them or give them something to do you know because you always want to encourage the next the next ones uh but to your point about how you're tuning out things that would otherwise distract you. The best part to me about performing live is that I, I, I go into a battle mentality. Uh, actually, there's like this audience and there's lights and there's all of these things going on around you, but you have to tune that out. And the band is relying on you because if you make a mistake, there are real consequences. Everybody hears it. There's no secrets. We're live. Everything's exposed, right? And so you and the band are in your secret world. You're queuing in. You've got your guide track. You've got your click track. That click track is really the master, right? Because it's the absolute time. And all I'm doing is playing along to that click track. And my number one job is like just like a commander in a battlefield. I'm trying to get my band through this gig safely, which means yeah. there's girls screaming, people jumping around. Say, so our, my job is to tune all of that out, listen to the click in the guide, and we've got to get from the beginning of the song to the end of the song safely without something blowing up and somebody dying, just like we practiced it, and then it's on to the next one. And the goal of this gig is to do that for five songs safely, and then we're on to the next one, right? You know what that reminds me of? That reminds yeah. me of the Mad Max movies, the more recent one, where they had the, the heavy metal guitarist up on the pole attached to one of the like the big doom buggies. They're mm -hmm. going through the desert, and he's jamming out to hard rock and just fire all over the place. <laughs> Do you remember that from the movie? I, mm -hmm. I haven't really seen it, but yeah, I have, uh, that's that's awesome. But yeah, that, that that's yeah, very much what it feels like. Battle. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Um, all right, let's. Uh, what, what else do you guys want to chat about? We we still got a, a, a little bit of time here. I want to make sure. Just uh, what kind of questions do you guys have for James? One thing I want to touch on is James. Tell me about your you know your origin story in this community. Give us a, the quick uh, rundown of your background and then how you ended up, let's say, active um, in this community, and then also what your aspirations are going forward. All right. So growing up, um, my mom religion hopped a lot. Um, because she had this idea that Bible God is true, but where does get Bible God want her? What church? What denomination? Mm, what, okay. Things like that. Um, so, so she was going through that, and I remember it quite well. Now, she ended up settling on Jehovah's Witnesses for the longest time, most of my childhood. And uh, they, they made it the most brutal form of it possible, uh, because my, mm. my stepdad was a, um, a severe narcissist himself. And... So he turned it into his own little cult with a Jehovah Witness theme. So he made it worse than it had to be. But, I mean, it would have been bad anyways. Um, and, and it took me many, many years to realize why my mom became religious and why she stayed religious. She, Her father was a larger-than-life figure, and she always felt like she needed to win his approval and his validation. And he catered to that. He intentionally sculpted her psychology in that way because he liked being adored. and He liked her mm. hinging her sense of worth on his approval. He liked it. He found it useful. And uh, so she was, when she ended up getting pregnant with me, uh, she was only 14. She was 15 when she had me. And so she ruined their plans. She, she betrayed God. She let them down. And um, so they forced her to have kind of a shotgun wedding with my 18-year-old um, father, 19-year-old father, or whatever he was at the time. Wait, and, and who's, uh, wait, what plan did she ruin? She ran, she ruined their plan. Now they 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 were conservative Catholics, and they just kept having kids. And the idea was to maintain their blue collar lifestyle, and then each child would help raise the next child, and then raise the next, like the Duggars. Okay, okay, um, okay. So she ruined that for them. Now now their plans were were screwed, and they didn't forgive her for that. And she felt so shamed 
and so mm-hmm. hollowed out by not just losing her father's approval, but with this idea that she could never get it back. And she went through the rest of her life trying to find a surrogate father whose approval she could have. Um, and oh, my she goodness. Tried to an extent to find that in abusive, heavy handed men who were, of course, of course. abusive. Um, but also, God was this ultra super surrogate um, th- who's, if she could earn his approval, he would. That would last. That would endure, and then she could be a good little girl. She she could heal that sense of emptiness that her father left from withdrawing his approval from her. And I didn't understand that for the longest time. And so that's really what hooked her into Christianity. And it's something she never outgrew. I tried to help her, and I just couldn't. And eventually admitted I just couldn't. But um, she raised me to help make up the difference for her. But she. I'm sure you've heard different statements, different phrases like um, unconditional love and long suffering and and things like that. They sound so noble. They sound so enlightened. Yes, but but it's the invitation to abuse. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, it is. You you already know where I'm going with that. So I grew up with this idea that she had this emptiness inside her shape with a void she couldn't fill. And I would be this endless wellspring of give. um, And then she would have this sort of daily healing and she also took it further than that she said look if you're nice to somebody they're nice to you back you're kind of getting paid for your kindness but if you're nice to somebody they're not nice to you back that's true altruism that's true selflessness that's what jesus taught she said now i'm not going to argue whether or not jesus taught that or not but this is the narrative that she gave me and so i went through my life dating some really abusive women over the years without realizing I was just repeating the pattern that I had with my mother. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, I feel That's a testimony up in here. Go ahead, James. So go ahead. Give me testimony. I want to hear it. Oh, no, I can't. I, we don't have time, James. We don't have time. But let's just say a very a whole lot of what you just said. Yeah, yeah. So that that's where I was at. So eventually I stopped dating abusive women. And then, but the last one I dated, she, another narcissist, She's what actually helped me understand Christianity better because I recognized all the mm-hmm. correlations of behaviors and the, and, and, and the values and the narratives and the way they try to tell you who you are. They try to tell you who you are because they need to crutch your sense of identity and your sense of worth on their validation. And I kept over giving to these women that were takers, thinking that that made me. Miserable. All right, James, testimony. So I see, so I see what you did there. You were like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this testimony out of him. All right, yeah. I'm gonna just give you one of them. The last abusive girl I dated, I ended up telling her she shouldn't date black men, and the reason I did that was because of exactly what you just said. Um, she she would not stop going on about how great it was to date such an independent and great black man who was a scholar and had a PhD and did all these things. And I constantly needed to be celebrated. And I was like, damn, ain't nobody ever really say it to me like that. And what I realized was exactly what you said. For the most part, if you were to just date me and be like, oh, you know what, Jay, I realized there's so much great about you, but you're literally crazy as a motherfucker, so I'm out. I'd be like, yeah, okay, that's that's pretty much what happened, right? But when you build me up in this particular way that I hadn't been built up, and then you lead me, and then you make me feel like crap, I'm like, whoa, you can't be doing that. Like, that's crazy, because I was like, don't do, like, that's so hurtful, that's so toxic. And in a world where it's literally hard to survive as being black, to, like, build me up as a black person and then completely undermine the identity that you just built up and the independence that it takes to actually do that, specifically by, like, pressing on that particular sensitivity. Oh, she did a number on me. Go ahead, I'm I'm done. All right, you got that out of me, but that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear you. I hear you. And so it was It was a very painful growing experience for me to recognize that in the end, I was complicit in my own abuse. I lent myself to it. And I did so for these ideals that, that weren't as well thought out as I thought that they were. But they are ideals that are prevalent in Christianity. And then I realized just how messed up Christianity is because it tries to do all those same things. It tries to crutch your sense of worth, um, your, your value, your identity, on um, mm-hmm. a narrative that they control. And so um, it's a, it creates a certain kind of vulnerability that they exploit. And then I realized I can't keep doing that. I've, I've got to grow 
in these ways that make me identity independent, that make me autonomous in that way. And, and not to the point where I never care what anybody thinks because we are social creatures. I don't want to like pretend that I've ascended beyond all considerations of what anybody thinks. There's still some subtle influence there. I still have reasons, practical reasons to, in some settings, in some contexts, care what somebody thinks. Mm -hmm. But but it's within a much healthier limit now. I don't crutch my, my, my sense of who I am and what I'm worth. Um, somebody else's opinions or their narrative. Um, I, I consider what people say. And sometimes mm -hmm. people are right. They'll call me out on my bullshit and I'll be like, damn, they're right. Like, that was my bullshit. I need to own that shit. Um, so they're not out. You know, that's why I listen. Because if I get into this mental state where nobody, nobody has any influence at all, where nobody has any input at all, then I'll just be stuck. I won't be able to grow from other people's input and from, you know, because people can notice things about us that we don't notice about ourselves. So I need sure. that input to come in, you know, call me on my bullshit, please. Because if it's my, if it's real, then I, then I want to notice it so that I can, that I can grow past it. So um, a lot of hard lessons. So, so much pain and confusion. Um, but, you know, I came out on the other end of it. And I think so, I'm stronger. So tell me how right. you, oh, go ahead. Okay, I got a question about this. So let's say we know someone who is immersing themselves into the Christian religion. I, I could acknowledge, um, having been there, that it is essentially asking you, as many religions do, it, it's asking you to lose yourself in order to become the best version of you that you can be. Uh, you Christians listening may recall the story of the rich young ruler where Jesus says, if you would be perfect sell all you have and give the money to the poor. And the guy just sort of walks off and we don't know that he ever did it. I don't think it says that he ever did it. Um, why? He found some pleasure or identity in those things. Also that the sacrifice was to be perfect and you could essentially become a martyr for the Christian religion if you were following Jesus. You could It could cost you your life which would make you a sacrifice. So the sacrifice is to be without blemish or defect. So anyway, all that to say, so if we know somebody who is immersing themselves and we see them not becoming a better person, but sort of becoming maybe the worst they can be rather than the best that they can be, what's a great way to intercede and maybe offer a course correction uh, whether you speak the language of the Bible or not, you know, whether you like I could throw out scriptures for pretty much any argument that you need to give someone. But um, what about someone who can't? Uh, what's the best way to gently approach that friend or family member and offer them correction? And actually, maybe it's a better question. What do you wish you had had uh, advice from a friend? when you were really going through that and suffering with oh, those women, okay. with those women, what do you wish you had? Right. So I wish I would have had a mentor, um, mm -hmm. a father figure or a trusted friend or somebody, because I was really alone in the world for, for all of my journey. I've never really had somebody that had my back. And mm -hmm. so I had to like learn the hard way, all the things that needed to be learned. So, you know, so much pain could have been avoided if I just would have had a really sober, mature person in my world saying, well, OK, I get where you're at. But have you considered, you know, that this might be this way or that you might be better off that way or that your worth and value are here instead of over here? Have you mm -hmm. considered that? And I would have listened. I would have figured the heart. I would have wrestled with it. Um, but I, you know, I didn't have that. So. If, if there was any one advice that somebody could have given me in that position that would have made the world of difference, it would have been to recognize my worth, uh, to understand that my worth does not come from other people's opinions of me, that my worthiness to exist, my worthiness to be seen and heard and respected and you know, it, all these things that they are not dependent upon somebody else's story, somebody else's narrative, somebody else's authority, um, somebody else's opinion. If, if they could have helped me understand that no, nobility is character, nobility, um, and it can be seen in sacrifice, but not wasteful sacrifice to people that don't appreciate it. 
um, if they if they could have helped me understand the need for balance. You know, if the if the ocean quits giving up its water to the sky, or if the sky quits raining down its water back to the ocean, both will die. There is an a, there, there is a balance that's required between systems in any ecosystem, including a social ecosystem, um, that is absolutely essential. If one organism over sacrifices its own interests um, out of a sense of um, misguided, disproportionate um, admiration for some other organism in, in the system, the organism itself will begin to die. As that mm -hmm. organism begins to falter in its ability to function in a healthy way, the larger ecosystem that it was trying to help begins to suffer as a result of the loss. So this is a so so amazing Beautiful answer. Yeah, really wonderful. Um, and there's so much here to touch on. One thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, do you think then, because I feel like it's immoral to uh, command someone to love their enemy. Like, I, I, it took me a long time to figure that out. But once I really started, that, I was like, wow, like, that's right there. But I think that's terrible to teach someone. Sure, sure. So I do think it's immoral to tell somebody how they have to feel about anything, period. Like, wow, somebody, yeah, yeah. Speak yeah. to that. Yeah. So, but at the same time, when it comes to loving my enemies, I see people in, in a multifaceted sort of way. So if I had to take, if I were to look at the people that have done me the most dirty in my life, the, the, the parts of them that did that thing, that fought in those ways and behaved in those ways, I do not love that structure within them. That structure is awful and it needs to go. I don't love that at all. It needs to go. But at the same time, I recognize that most people also have something within them that is either as it shines now or as it has the potential to shine that is worthy of, of, of being respected and nurtured and valued. So when I say, if I, I could say that I love an enemy, um, but what I mean by it is I love that within them, either the spark that is or the potential of the spark that could be. I love and, and value that. Um, whereas I do not love the larger structure of ideas and thoughts and impulses that did me dirty. So I, 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 dissect them in that kind of way, and I make those kinds of differentiation. Uh, yeah, I think that's really wise. Also, I I want to just quickly distinguish between, say, like a Darth Dawkins, who I might be my enemy in a conversation, whereas my point is more when someone actually intends to do you harm or is actively doing you harm, right, that's when it's, like, totally a different thing. Go ahead, my one black friend. All right, so here, here's, your, here's your Jesus, folks. Here's your few minutes of Jesus. So I want to just address... When Jesus is saying, you know, you should love your enemy, it's it's meant in a way that will reform your enemy, your oppressor. If you return the oppression to the oppressor, you're what? You just spoke about a cycle, James. You're making that cycle endure. Mm -hmm. He says in Romans, uh, not Romans, somebody else says this, uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing this, you'll be heaping burning coals on his head. So it's it's sort of that way. How can a person stay cruel if you're kind? Again, so much of the, the message in early Christianity is about self-sacrifice. Why? Because they're expecting the end of the world. Again, this this is an apocalyptic group of people. Yeah, and it's it's funny, they're, like well, well, God, 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 God. They're, they're, they're in an environment where you have all these Hebrew people who have a long tradition of celebrating and fearing and worshiping Yahweh from the Old Testament. Jesus is essentially a ref, his movement is a reform movement of that, where some of the rules that are very heavy handed are being relaxed and then paul what he's a reformer too you get right. these other letters in the, or we see this constant reform going on so whereas in the old testament there's a lot of well you just god will do your fighting for you god will fight your battles for you that's being reinforced here but now the effort is not in resistance it's pacifism Right. They're really going to let God. But, take care but of it. look, but they're look, really going to let God take care of it. And they're not going to get involved 
uh, if they if they want your what is this, something about give them your cloak too. If they ask for your uh, if they ask you to walk with them one mile, you walk with them too. Again, it's the idea of giving the people who are persecuting you more than they're asking for. And maybe the people who need your help, giving them more than they are asking for. Why? Because your things, my fortune cookie, my pen, I don't really need these things, right? I, it, my lifestyle can kind of prove it. I, I leave home for half a year. I have a, a house full of things, three cars. I don't really need that stuff. I don't have it now. It's all back there. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. So, to 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 the point most of our things we don't walk around with so in in I'll circle it back to the enemy portion if a person is capable of great cruelty they likely are capable of even greater kindness and perhaps by snapping that person out of their need to be violent you then are rescuing that person to be the kind person they want to be. We see that with the Apostle Paul character in the Bible. Saul, right? He's persecuting Christians. One day he has a stroke or uh, an epileptic seizure or whatever. And mm. now, hey, you know what? These Christians are really on to something. I was blind and uh, this guy on Straight Street fixed me up. Now I can see pretty well. And I, I see I was wrong to ever be bothering those good people. And I'm going to become one of them because it seems like an honorable path. My one black friend, there's like, there's been like a gazillion gems here. Uh, one is, so now uh, I'm thinking of this sort of naturalistic Paul apologetic, and it's like, so what? What if Paul, so what if Paul was just having an epileptic seizure? So what if that explains, uh, you know, why he saw something and the people with him didn't see anything? If he has this radical transformation, maybe your cousin or two that was a Christian, right? And we get this thing. If in the end, he's kind of documenting an early version of what we were talking about at the start of this conversation, working towards a more humanistic uh, Christianity, right? In some sense, he's even saying, even I thought as a Christian, right? He's kind of saying, hey, with those, with, the, with that uh, Peter and James are doing, like, yeah, I know they were claiming like they were buddies of the dude and they've got the real Hebrew Jesus's story of how to, you know, fix the Torah. But like, hey, I went up to them for a couple weeks and I was like, hey, man, uh, look, let's get to, let's uh, break bread here for a while, guys. Look, you guys could do that if you want to, but I really think we got to expand this to the Gentiles, make it a little bit easier to onboard, you know, correct some of this Torah stuff. People don't have time for 361 laws, you know, <laughs> right so it's it's kind of it's kind of weird like um that 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 you guys are making me think of that also you were literally changing my feelings on this like of course like we i think we're all on the same board about you know commanding that you love someone that's actively abusing you but but to speak to the value of some of this you made me think about pacifism sometimes uh what, what i really reacted to was like we think of pacifism as oh you want to club me over the back of the head i'm just going to stand here and let you club me over the back of the head and then i'll, I'll deal with it later right but what I'm really thinking of pacifism is like active um, and sometimes it's it's beautiful. Right. Um, it, it, and it can be a tactic, almost a military one. So I call it sometimes the power of the powerless. It comes from accepting the reality of your lack of force and then working within that. So the example I gave is when I was um, in college. Uh, I wanted to be uh, a medical marijuana law reformer. I thought if I could legalize pot in my college town, it'd be great practice for law school. 19-year-olds are stupid. All right. But when I did that, I had this problem. Like, I'm a, I'm a black kid in this majority white campus. I'm on a full scholarship. If I get in trouble with the law, it's going to be a big thing. And, like, what I'm going to do if the police come and find me and they target me? Or I could be in a lot of trouble. It could, like, ruin my career before it even gets started. Well, I was like, if they do that, I'm fucked. And I can't stop them. I can't stop them from tapping my phone or making me the target. You're kind of paranoid, right? You're a paranoid kid who smokes a lot of pot. You're like, this could go bad, right? So instead, what did I do? I just worked with the police department. I called the police chief's assistant. I was like, how does he like his coffee? Oh, I got this. I go to the best uh, coffee shop in town. I show up to meet the chief of police. I go, heard you like it black. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> Him and I were good friends from that moment on. I did the same thing with the university police department. I'd do all these events, and I'd, I'd always bring the police department. I'd invite them. Those guys would show up themselves after work. The, the director of the university police department, the chief of police himself. Why? Because just like I figured out, there's no way I can do this without these guys. And if they actually try to flex their muscles on me, I can't flex back. So kill them with kindness is kind of the only thing I got, right? Better to be a known entity and, like, they're not going to mess you with me than otherwise. Thrill them. Thrill them with kindness. Thrill them with kindness, right? And I, I used to, I used to have marketing my, degree, James. I used to have my dreads. Thrill them with yeah, I used to have That's dreads and a, and, a, and a staff, <laughs> right? I was kind of a, like a Moses figure or whatever, right? And to their thinking, I think they were like, we've had a lot of these radical pot people come along. They're always like shaming the police and speaking out against the police department. I never did that. I always refused to do that. And I also never did public debates, right? I actually I had like an email exchange one time with the police chief about research. And he sent me back some really bad research. And I was like, oh, my goodness, if I wanted to make the police and the police department here look stupid, this would be gold. I didn't do that. I scheduled a meeting with them. I ordered the study myself and I went through it with them and explained why it was bad research privately. Right. Um, and so that type of thing, I think, made me like, yeah. And if we got to deal with uh, pot reformers in a college town, we'd rather go with Jay. Right. than other people. And so there was a mutual kind of like thrill them with kindness, right? It was, it went, it, it went both ways. Um, so my point there is, is it's not necessarily like a weakness thing. Sometimes it can be, I actually have a goal and maybe it is to influence these people, but it's better to find common ground and accept the fact that I can't overwhelm them with force. And maybe this is what Jesus is teaching his people. Like, hey, when the army comes, if you think you're going to be able to get more swords than them and collect more gold, like you might as well quit while you're ahead. So when they roll on y'all, uh, look, invite them in, you know, cook them a nice meal, say, hey, soldier, I know you look you're probably pretty tired from all that marching, you know, right? And you might survive, and then they'll let well, you, you go on ministering. With, you do that, you end up with advocates, not enemies. How do you become you the official your, state religion of the, 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 the oppressing ruling empire, right? Pretty effective, maybe. Well, no, it's <laughs> proof that you're useful. That's what I'm saying. Like, they, they, they might they be take over your... They take they take over your organization and they run it the way they want it to be run, and you don't even know what happened. And then one day you die, and no one knows that you had other motives, you had other ideas about it, because they just go ahead and say whatever about you they wanted to if they include you at all. Yeah, you just keep writing, rewriting history. And it's it's really interesting, like um, in some sense, uh, the same way you always say religion is useful. I think really breaking down the sort of tactics and the social bonds and, and sort of the structure and the methodology of religion allows you to understand what's useful about it and implement it in secular context. James, I wanted to touch on how did you get involved in the YouTube community? Did you have a growth towards uh, the progression of maybe uh, you start in the comment section and you're chatting? Like, how did you start engaging? What did that process look like for you? Well, for years, I just, it was just as simple as following and commenting on popular uh, channels for atheist content um, after I deconverted, um, thanks mostly to uh, Dark Matter 2525. Well, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a content creator that played a heavy role in that. It's always interesting. Oh, a, he a heavy role in that, absolutely. I, just, just quickly, um, I found the content after I deconverted. That's the difference. Go ahead. All right. So, yeah, he, you know, I had spent enough time outside the direct influence of Christian circles that I had begun already to own my own headspace. And so that made it possible to really kind of let it in when I started being exposed to um, critical facts and logic. And so I watched his video about the flood narrative, um, Noah's flood. And he just went through one after one, one point after the next about how even with God magic, it isn't just that it couldn't have happened. We know it didn't happen this way. We mm -hmm. know it did not. And it wouldn't make any sense for it to have happened that way. And it, and it really got me thinking. And that was, that was the beginning of a series of epiphanies that quickly led to my absolute deconversion. 
um, mm-hmm. the, that's the, the floodwaters, the, the, the dam burst, I guess was, was how I put that. And then after that, I just stayed, you know, active, just um, watching videos and stuff. It really wasn't until Myth Vision and then noticing that there was um, like a, a recently developing community of networked new fresh content creators um and a lot of them are connected with rebecca but they've always also got their own channels and um you know they're, they're actively supporting each other and actually actively engage with each other and they're not just echo chambering because they're including people like rebecca and that really impressed me and there's just i mean now is the time there's this there's this whole new social network forming in youtube this whole new generation of 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 people that are really willing to have the, the real discussions and see where they go. And so the more I've been participating in that these last few months, um, the more I want to be part of it is just picking up steam for me. Talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, your blog, uh, and, and where you're going in terms of what you'd like to do on Facebook, what you'd like to do with your channel. Uh, what does the future look like for you? And, uh, before you b- do hopefully uh, I might have a little bit of influence on that because I'm trying to, uh, you know, as, as I make friends, trying to bat ideas off each other and see how we can work together. But go ahead. Sure, absolutely. I'd love to officially start being a content creator on YouTube. I haven't decided on the exact format yet, but it's coming really soon. Like, I'm ready. I'm there. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I just... I'm open to it. You know, I'm, I'm open to suggestions and, and collaborations. I've been talking to people that say they might want to be part of that on my channel. And uh, I just want to be part of the community, part of the network, and just let it form naturally as we work together and uh, just see where it leads. That's great. For me, for me to be explicit, like, uh, what I love is uh, removing barriers to people. So my one black friend kind of hit me up and was like, hey, man, we should do something. And I was like, yeah, let's do something. Because when am I going to get to do some, something with somebody cool like this, right? And so since I'm kind of a tech geek and I actually, I'm a production nerd, actually live in a studio, right? I'm sort of like, hey, maybe what I could do is like take care of the technical headaches and the behind the scenes mm-hmm. stuff. That way for most people, they're like, hey, I want to make content. They could just jump on. And um, what I'm really trying to do now is like build this network because it helps me professionally, right? People don't realize I'm an evolutionary mm-hmm. biologist, but most people have a, a sort of a broader tent academically. And for me, my specialty is not just digital evolution, but also the intersection of science and multimedia, right? So one mm-hmm. thing my research advisor and my teaching mentor love is that they realize this is all science communication and outreach and stuff like that. So they're like, oh, this is all great for what you're doing. And so figuring out all these technical challenges allow me to take somebody like you and say, hey, James, you want to help making content? I could like shortcut you to all the stuff we've learned <laughs> mm-hmm. you know the sort of you know speed bumps we've had to go over and why we choose to do this instead of that and ways we're looking to grow in the future and sort of help people so i'd love to do that and then i think with the with the sort of cult of the flying man the thing the idea was to uh really build up we call it the cult of internet personalities right and that my, my sort of thinking was you have your mods and people that are active in the chat and the community and they become ushers. And then people that are sort of like a no name, you know, they like a, like side men. They want to be like regular panelists and help out, but they don't have their own channels or spaces. I think of them as like deacons, right? They're regular people. They hop on. They're welcome to help us co-host and facilitate anything. But they, they kind of want to be on the side because they don't have as much responsibility. Right. And then the people like Tux or my one black friend who want to, you know, actually have a channel and be a host and do their Mm -hmm. own thing. I consider them like pastors and, you know, they've got their own, you know, thing. You should really follow them because they've got their own space and their own kind of way and personality and their own tactics and stuff like that. My one black friend has very different counter apologetics than Tux, for instance. Totally different, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Right. And so, you know, I'd love to, to like, uh, you know, put you on that, you know, sort of roster of people where you have your own channel and, and I could just help you and, and get you going and figure out what you what you want that to look like and, and be happy that's, to help you with that. 
that's a beautiful idea. Yeah, we've each got our own voice as part of the tapestry, and right. we just mutually support each other to go in the directions that we want to go. And I want to say hi, hi, Rebecca. She's, yeah. she's the other. Champion. The other thing. What? Bright of Life is here. Oh yeah, my goodness. Here. Oh, I can't. All right, I'm gonna. I'm. 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 Uh, I'm gonna get shy and nervous because uh, I feel like every time these uh, community celebrities pop up, like Danny or Rebecca. I, I start. You can't tell, but I'm blushing. You know. What, what do you mean you can't tell? I'm blushing. You're racist. No. Um, but no, Rebecca. Thanks so much. We appreciate that. Um, and thanks for coming through the chat. You know. You know. I love the viewers. Love the viewers. But uh, appreciate people coming through the chat, letting us know they're here. But also, James, uh, we want to get the website going. So this helps kick me in gear on that. And uh, I also want to. I'm in the multimedia, right? And so it shouldn't just be YouTube videos. Uh, I want us to get in whatever else we want to stream. If you want to do some, uh, you know, craft work or or gaming or whatever, but also like uh, your blog, right? I've always wanted to have a website where people can go. So I'm going to find a way to get our website together so people can go to blogs and we can actually kind of follow and support your written content. And then maybe we can figure out a way to start doing broad broadcast around your post, right? So that we can right. use your content to kind of, you know, promote each other. So I have a friend that I bounce my, my uh, blogs off of. Um, it, I just, I kind of think I could pay anybody to read my blogs most of the time. And she's like, look, you've got a dynamic personality and mm -hmm. way of speaking these, these, these things to life. And it, when people are reading it, they're not reading it in your voice. They're not reading the inflections where you want them. They're not reading the emphasis where you want it. They're not getting the entire spirit of what you're saying. And so I think she's right. I need to take the content in my blogs and turn them into something on YouTube. So that mm -hmm. Good idea. I, have, I think that's what I need to do with those. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And actually, my, my thing that I think uh, I'm realizing this, the algorithm just wants content. Uh, but different content serves different purposes. So one of the things I want to start doing for this channel and my other channels is producing little videos because, again, it's just easier for somebody to consume and discover a five-minute clip than a four-hour stream, right? And so right. uh, a lot of those things help in terms of they're shareable on social media, they're really great for promotion, and they get people to your channel, and they'll like and subscribe. And then when you go live and do a stream, more people can find it and uh, watch it, right? But then again, it's really good to do the live streams because if you've got a few viewers who will watch your 10-minute videos, even if it's four viewers, YouTube is like, dude, if you can get them to stay on this YouTube platform for like uh, four hours and just sit there and watch you, and they'll engage in the chat. Oh, oh, YouTube's like, oh, we like this. You're one of our favorite. You might only have four viewers, but we love your four viewer community. It's active, right? It's engaging. Y'all are clicking links, donating, finding other content, recommending other, putting up, putting up just other YouTube links in the community. Like, they love it, right? Um, so I, I would suggest doing that. And so what you might do is, as you're writing, as you're revising, sort of do some live streams where you're showing people your process. Cause I would love to see how you write. And, and you know, the writing process is really the revising process. I would, I would watch somebody like you take me through how you're making your little video, right? And then release the video on your channel. And then I'd go, oh guys, let's, you can make that a little event. Hey guys, let's go watch the, the premiere of uh, James's video. And then we see your little 10 piece, 10 minute piece or whatever. And we're sharing that all over the place, right? But you could also put the streams there. So uh, don't be afraid to show people uh, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Cause I think uh, mm -hmm. content is content and it's great if you just use it strategically. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys have any? We try to wrap up usually around five thirty. Oh, wait, we're good. We're good. I'm good till six. So uh, sometimes I have uh, I have my my I have a gaming club that meets at six o'clock, but every other week the officers meet at five thirty. Uh, this week we're not. We're we're off. So I'm good till six. Uh, it is about five thirty. So we've got about thirty minutes left. Um, what else, any anything else you got to talk about? I wanted to talk about your content. So thank you so much. That was my big thing. Uh, we can always go back to the blog post or any other thing, but uh, my one black friend, I'm sure you've had plenty of thoughts. So, uh, what else? Anything else? What else do you want to talk about? I'll have to excuse myself and come right back. Oh, good, good. Take, take, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> it's like, it's like three yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. You can uh, take, turn your camera off, mute. You're good. 
Um, I'll just mute. So, uh, James, tell me more about uh, just anything. Yeah, open open discussion. So, a lot of my views, a lot of my headspace is pretty controversial. Oh, yeah, let's come, get into that. Yeah, go you know, ahead. If, if it were to come out completely unfiltered, I'm going to make a lot of people really, really unhappy. Oh, yeah, no, so, no, no. This is hot program. Get, 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 turn it up. Turn it up. Give us a little teaser. Give us, let's, yeah, let's, let's get, a, let's get hot for a little bit. So, I mean, you could probably scroll down at some point. I mean, you don't have to do it now, but my blog, like the posts. Oh, yeah, like yeah. I, Is there something? Give me a highlight from this particular post, maybe, right? So we can promote people to uh, so read some more me, of this. Let me, let, me tell, let, me, let me talk about a different blog that I made that, that connects to this one. Oh, sure, sure. Right. I had this friend, and she had what I call a beautiful soul, and I'm sure she still does. We lost contact. But she, would, she would commune with trees. She would go for long walks in nature. And she would swear that the trees had a presence to her, that they spoke with her, not audibly, but she could still like feel what they were saying. And she'd have these conversations with them. Now, did I, do I really think she had conversations with trees? No. Um, but what she was doing is she was experiencing herself. She was projecting her own might, her own observations about the world and her own whimsical nature and her own loving nature. Um, it, it, she was projecting that forward and she was getting it back from the experience. And it was giving her a rare opportunity, a special opportunity to um, meet herself in deep and profound ways. Um, and and I, thought, I found that that was really beautiful. So ne never, never even for a moment did I want to tell her, you know, trees don't really talk, you know that, right? Like I never wanted to come at her as this dry combative atheist ever. I would never want to take that from her. And um, so on, on a certain level, I think that's what happens with a lot of people in their relationship with God, their walk with God. Um, they're, they're experiencing dimensions of themselves, their, their capacity to be loving and, um, and humble and all these other virtues. And it's, you know, they're projecting it and it's coming back to them through the narrative. And in doing so, they oh. give themselves... Yeah, they, they, they foster that growth within themselves. And it, it's just a beautiful thing. Like, when I think about it, I almost want to cry. It's so beautiful. Yeah, so, yeah. It, you're, you're, you're making me think of my mother and my grandmother and, and all the people in my family who I just love so much. Yeah, this is the beautiful side, right? Yeah. Right. So there's this dimension of it. And I've seen this with Christians as well in, in what they call their walk with God. And so there's a dimension of it there's layers of it that are that are good and that are that are nurturing and wholesome and and productive in ways that i think a lot of overly skeptical or overly polarized atheists don't notice or appreciate um but but at the same time the problem that i have with with biblical narratives and biblical religion being the means by which this happens is because what that really amounts to is people actual people hiding behind the trees and projecting their voice so now here you're having this experience you're meeting yourself and that's being infused with the voice of other people so you're you, you're you're not honestly meeting yourself you're not accurately meeting yourself it's jumbled in with these ideas from other people and you're and you're busy with this sense of loyalty to the narrative trying to harmonize all of that as one voice and trying to justify everything that it says to you with a sense of loyalty to the narrative that overrides sometimes your best judgment you and I was just going to quickly say you hear people uh, say you're better than the God. You're better than your God. Um, and uh, like I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And it's often uh, such an identity reaffirming loop that I think that's what's so difficult people to challenge. Because when you challenge their God, quote unquote, belief, it isn't really a belief that you're challenging to them. It's their identity. And I think it's because their entire maturation process has been in that loop. Uh, Rebecca, uh, I think, mentioned something about, you know, thinking people might not believe in evolution if they were as critical of it. Um, Sorry, I had to cough. Cameron said, Jay and James, do you guys honestly, and I guess my one black friend as well, you just were uh, away, I think. Um, Jay and James, do you guys, so do you guys honestly take a critical look in evolution as you have done with the Bible? Uh, I, we asked again some other points. I'll, I'll still open it up, but uh, I want to hear you guys respond to that. James, I'll start with you and then my one black friend, and then I'll go last mm -hmm. on this one since uh, obviously I have thoughts about evolution. So there's a very limited scope of applicability for how evolution um, 
determines the way that we live our lives. We can look at it in terms of historically how it helped wire us, but our views about whether or not evolution is true and how it how it did or didn't work don't have a very dramatic or very direct and strong impact on our personal values in the here and now, how we relate to other people, the things that we think are valuable or not valuable, um, the, the ideals that resonate for us on a personal level. Like, no matter what we think about evolution, it doesn't have a big impact. For that reason, I haven't spent nearly as much time concerning myself with the details of cell biology or uh, genetics and epigenetics or things like that. A, a measure of time. I've, I spent a measure of time on the issue. But like you said, I mean, it just requires so many years of schooling <laughs> to, to really even get the basics down for evolution because it's a complex topic with a lot of complex facts to dive through. And I could spend my time that way, but I prefer to spend my time studying things that have a very direct impact on the way that people relate to themselves and to other people and to understanding not just what people think, but why they think it and what, what people feel, but also why they feel it and, and what forces of influence can we introduce into that equation to have a positive effect. So if, you know, have I spent nearly as much time studying evolution? No. And it's because it doesn't hold a lot of answers in that domain for me. If I found that it did, I'd spend a whole lot more time. On so it. maybe so, it's, I'm just sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I uh, get what you're saying. In some sense, you're saying I haven't been as critical of evolution, but that's also because you don't promote it or see it as necessarily as practical in this space. And you spent more time criticizing faith in the Bible because that seems to be much more central to what actually people seem to believe and how they live based on what they believe. Yeah, so I, you know, as far as being critical of evolution, I think it requires an awful lot of formal education to even be qualified to be critical of evolution. I mean, to be critical in a general sense of prove it, that's good. That's a healthy thing, even for any layman. Sure, but sure. But critical, critical in a sense where you're going to try to dismantle it and disprove it or whatever, like... Anybody coming at it from that angle is coming at it wrong. You know, when I look at the Bible and I look at faith and I look at religion and things like that, I'm not looking at it as I'm going to dismantle it and prove it wrong. It's not that at all. I simply want to understand where it's coming from, how it developed, how it affects the way that people relate to themselves and to other people and differentiate healthy versus unhealthy social systems and you know, try to find my place within those in a healthy way as well. So, you know, I see merit. I don't throw out baby Jesus with the bathwater. I see merit, just as you guys do, to various things, various ideas that were expressed in, in Bible stories, you know, and I am able to say, hey, I love this thing, but I hate this other thing, you know, and I, I don't feel like I have to throw it all out or accept it all. Um, I don't have loyalty to a narrative. And that's my biggest asset, I think, as a free thinker, is that my sense of worth and identity is based upon basic values that I've really thought through. And so, I, you know, somebody could prove to me tomorrow that there's a super creator that could convince me, in other words. And it wouldn't really change anything for me because I'd still have the same values that I have now. And I would not adopt a loyalty to a religious narrative, even if somebody convinced me that there is a super creator with a lot in common with Bible God. Uh, you know, I would still, if, if I believed that figure existed, I'd still see his opinions as opinions. I'd still see his failings as failings. I, you know, I, <laughs> That it's that right, simple right, for me. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. I just wanted to say that the the boom was at Rebecca because she said she thinks any five year old could be critical of of uh, evolution. I just love that uh, Rebecca rolls through is throwing the the bombs, the haymakers, not holding back. We appreciate that. Uh, also, we're we're definitely going to set up round two of uh, Rebecca on Hot Program. Um, yes. My one black friend, go ahead. Uh, talk, yes. talk to me about evolution, my one black friend. Rebecca, I used to be five years old. <laughs> and, and you could have been I was, critical of evolution I back was, then. I was critical of Oh, of you were. All right, there yeah. we go. <laughs> so let, let's talk about this. When I was critical of evolution, people sat me down and explained things to me. 
again and again, and I learned more. I learned Punnett squares, learned a bit about DNA, proteins, RNA, and things like that. And over time, a very good case was built. I saw in my own family how we shared traits with one another. And then I, would, I had a cousin as a child who looked exactly like me. We, we looked like we were twins, but he had different parents. How is this transmitted? I mean, it's, it's clear there was something at work with genetics there. Meanwhile, at the Baptist church across the street, from where I lived when I was five years old, I would ask, hey, did Jesus go to other planets and talk to aliens? Shut up, boy. Stop asking questions, boy. Right? Do you see? I got pushback. As I got older and I could understand more what those stories in the Bible meant for myself, there was still pushback. When I would show, I would ask, like, well, how did God create the world? He simply spoke it into being. Well, all these people around me praying for God to do things, he's not doing anything. I don't see the changes. And yet I learned about genetic mutations, these things that just seem to happen on their own, or maybe there's some environmental factors like medications that cause deformities or medications that cause um, humans to, uh, uh, I would say, uh, their bodies to shut down or something like that. I would see how environmental factors could f affect people. As an adult, I saw Zika come onto the, uh, to the scene, and I saw that there was a commonality in the way that Zika babies looked, just like in Down syndrome people, no matter where they're from in the world, there's a tendency that they sort of look like. So I see if I, if, if, and that's just in my lifetime, let's say I give it a million years. How much, it, I isolate certain populations, right? How pronounced are those changes going to be then if they keep happening? And if they're also key, if they keep being dramatic, I can see that. When I look at the Bible and I see God making these promises and then I, I learn to write myself, right? I can, I learn to tell a good story. And I see these priests sort of going back through the Bible and cleaning it up making sure that every objection is answered in print, but not in the real world, right? Well, it's just going to happen on God's time. That's garbage. We shouldn't teach people that. That's wrong. It's not going to happen on God's time. If the world, if, if there truly was a God that wanted us, wanted us to have the desires of our heart, why would he wait so long? Why would my uncle, who was right, he was in a bad situation. He kept praying. His his uh, funeral flyer, which I looked at last Monday, says Reverend on it. Right? He's yeah. one of a few clergy members in my family. He considered himself to be very close to God. When he would speak to me, he would often mention God. He knew I was an atheist. He thought it wasn't the best idea of mine, and yet there he was for years dying in prayer got to the point where he could do almost nothing for himself and was miserable was this so that god could be glorified no he was waiting for god to rescue him he had doctor after doctor trying to help him but he was waiting on god and you can say well he didn't you know he just didn't pay attention to the people that god sent to him you mean those guys and gals that learn so much from evolution to get the medicines that they derived that could help his kidneys stop them from shutting down? And then they finally did. Um, right? So yeah. I think I think and I'm not really paying a lot of attention to what she's saying in the chat, but uh, hopefully oh, a lot of good stuff. She said she's looking forward to a conversation about um, evolution and uh, she did say at one point that you were conf uh, conflating genetics and uh, evolution. So we could get into more of that in our conversation. Uh, I think, Funk, uh, you don't Lewis. Have, if, if you don't have genetics, you don't have evolution. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of you guys, I appreciate you in the chat. Life, unless you're not talking about living beings. 
Um, including bacteria, you know, if that, cause that's a living thing too. But um, I, 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 what I, I just want to just uh, make sure we're with you. So, uh, what I hear you saying is you, you can see it. You think, you think just seeing, just based on what you observe sitting around the family table, you can I see it. it. It's, 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 it's not just something that is simply obvious, right? Because a person who believes in the God of the Bible, or whatever God you got in your pocket, Right. They could say, well, isn't this, isn't this obvious? Don't I observe this in the world? Isn't yeah. this really the mechanism that's at play behind it all? Yeah. And, and be perfectly fascinated and have this wonderful, beautiful, uh, delightful smile on their face while they are lying to me and themselves about the true cause. I don't know how the universe got here. I have no idea. And not so different from James, quite honestly, if I knew, wouldn't affect my life that much. There wouldn't, if if right. if I knew that putting mustard on my chicken sandwich would make the world a better place, fine, I'll put more mustard on it. If that's what it needs. If I have to literally sacrifice doves and burn goats, right? Have right. the priest kill some goats for me to appease the God in heaven. Does that really... Does it really work? Is that really apologizing for any wrongdoing I've done? It's going to cost the life of a goat. That'll make you think twice. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess. You know. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the animal sacrifice. Don't do it so the goat don't die. Yeah, the goat there you go. died because I misbehaved yeah. and wanted to reconcile myself with God. Are we Are we being honest? Yeah. So um, if, 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 if we as modern people, when we look, when you read that in your Bible, Rebecca, Right. When you see sacrificing a lamb for this sin offering or if you're cured of leprosy, you got to sacrifice two turtle doves uh, and one gets killed and the blood gets uh, sprinkled on the other dove. And, you know, all this stuff. Do we really need a scapegoat? That has now, come on, my sins? one black friend. You oh, know, we got the one I'm, scapegoat. We only got one. We got one one sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Now, you know that. As as I have as I have stated, and James, you would have missed out on this. As I have stated, I can write a better story. <laughs> I can write a better story, and it doesn't sure. take me much effort at all. Look, when Jesus died for your sins, the moment you become a Christian, you can't sin anymore. It's not that you don't want to; it's not possible. And this is the example that is set for all the world. See, when you come into Christianity, you are incapable of sin now. You are reconciled to God and your fellow human beings on this earth. And it works. You can test this in Christian after Christian after Christian. And you can't find a Christian that is able to sin. If it really worked, it would be that good. But it's not. Yeah, it's uh, not. And that it, let me just I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. I'm I not, I'm not trying to interrupt you. That is what is so dangerous. And people don't see it. That is what is so dangerous when we have politicians that are seeking to make this country follow what's in the Bible. And they have no concept of what's in there. They know some of the stuff that's like the hits like oh, I know part of a few. I know part of like 11 Rolling Stone songs. But I don't know any Rolling Stones songs. They know part of it. They know what makes it maybe dear, and they're trying to sac uh, trying to please someone else. But there's some horror stories in there, right? There's some horror stories. Yeah. If, if I'm if I'm told as I study the Bible in church that I'm supposed to be like Jesus or be like God, if I read the entire thing, I'm not a person who wants to conduct myself in the way that the Old Testament God does. Right. I'm I'm not afraid to say it. And I'd, if he had a face, I'd say it to his face. I know he's got a backside. It mentions that in the Bible. I'd say it to his backside, too. I'm better than you. I'm right. better than you. I can't right. pull I can't pull the universe. I mean, out he's going to he's going to condemn you to hell anyway. You might as well let him know what you really think. I think he would already know, wouldn't he? <laughs> he yeah that's true mind. right yeah you might as well let it out right he already knows uh, so I, I i think i i think that's the that's part of the real danger um to uncritically just buy into it i'm sorry that's not oh for, for me that's not okay uh for a while it was and i got to the point where i really took a good look at that bible and i was like nah I can't worship a God who's like this because I don't want to murder. Ooh, 
you're speaking to my soul because I feel yeah. like that's kind of the ultimate confession. And, uh, you know, sometimes I don't want to do the atheist versus Christian things thing anymore. I don't want to do it. I honestly want to go back to my Christian self and say, let's battle this out as Christians. Because Christian, okay, atheist J, right, only exists because Christian J went looking for the truth. And nowhere in the start of that process did Christian J ever think he was going to become an atheist. So what Jay, I really want to he ask, wants to get, the, he wants to go back in the matrix. I want to go back, back in, the, in matrix. the matrix. And I want, so then I want to have a conversation from that perspective and say, tell me what I missed. Tell me, tell me, tell me, I, cause I guess Jesus didn't love me enough to give me a good enough direct revelation or, uh, you know, all, like I love when the other guy the other night tried to tell us, oh, you did it cause Christians hurt you. You know, bad Christians. I know the best Christians. I know people that literally people are like, yo, if your grandparents aren't going to heaven, none of us are. I'm like, yeah. So I don't, I don't know where this notion of, I know bad Christians come from. Most of the best it's people I know are Christians. It's a script. It's the script. Jerry. So, but what did I, what did I miss? I didn't read the gospel correctly. I, what literally it feels like is I was a Christian Bible nerd, you know, looking to find the good apologetics. I wanted to literally learn more about the historicity of Jesus so I could better understand how to live like him and the whole script. And then I got off this path. So tell me what I missed. Um. <laughs> Allow me to illustrate. I have a fortune cookie in my right hand and one in my left hand. What does this one say? Does Well, no. Does this fortune cookie, does the fortune inside here have something that would benefit your life if you knew what it said? Say this again. Sorry, I was looking at there's it. The, there's, yeah. This is a fortune cookie. Yeah, yeah. And this is a fortune cookie. Does this have something on the fortune that could be relevant and beneficial to your life? Oh, yeah, absolutely. How about this one? Of course. <laughs> James? <laughs> of course. It, depending on how you interpret them, absolutely. Wait, did you not say something super key? Depending on how you interpret them. Wow. Right? Here we go. So I could pick up the Urantia book. I could pick up uh, the Bible. Here we go. Pizza. I could pick up the Bible. Oh, we got we got high level again, visual again. illustration by my one black friends, folks. YouTube content creators, pay attention. This is this is production value right here. This is show Your business. Sense of humor will get you through difficult times. Oh, so James, how would I interpret? I don't know how to do this. How would I interpret this? How would you interpret this in a religious way right now, please? <laughs> Through a religious lens? Yes. I don't even know. You know, there's no humor in the Bible. Like, Bible God, it, it, his entire narrative is just bereft of humor. It's just not there. He, he, he Way too serious, way too uptight. So um, religious people appreciate humor um i would say the only way they might appreciate it differently than a secular person is to do the same thing they do with all the other attributes they have to draw from they imagine that they wouldn't have them at all except that god's beaming it into their head and giving them the ability to have humor giving them the ability to have love and peace and kindness oh and what them. is the essential source of your humor and james that makes you a good communicator to pass on the gospel to those who need it most. I would I, I would say the Lord is speaking to me through this fortune cookie. And what he's saying is when these atheist haters, especially the YouTube perverts, because let's be honest, all these people want to do is just make atheist content so that they can make money and sin off the internet. When they start coming at you with all this counter apologetics, evidence this, rationality this, you got to just laugh them off. You gotta just laugh off the atheist, keep ministering the gospel, keep focused on your work with the Lord. Amen, Holly. Can I get amen, Rebecca? All right, go ahead. What's next? What's next? But okay. that's it. That's what I'd say. What's the next one? A friend's good advice will deliver great joy. Wait, say it again. Say it again. If friends sure. a friend's good advice will deliver great joy. Oh, oh, that's this is easy. And express. All right, James, uh, could we have you elucidate on this in a religious sense? Well, sure. They're going to be looking for religious fulfillment of it. They're going to be look, waiting for an, a moment when a friend gives them some advice, whether it has secular value or whether it has strictly religious value. 
and they're going to say, ah, look, this thing God communicated to me through this fortune cookie came true. Therefore, my religion is true. It's just going to, you know, they're going to turn it into something that, that validates the narrative, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. Pocket locker, how does this? Uh, you know, the, the, the Bible, the Bible says, the wisdom. Bible says where two or three are gathered, the Lord is in the midst. And so sometimes, you know, the Lord works in delirious ways. And, and so God, God can sometimes speak to you uh, in fellowship with the friend, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, hey, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy. <laughs> right? Hallelujah. Enter now into the joy. We need an amen bot. Um, but yeah, Rebecca said you were you were preaching my one black friend. Uh, you know, we got a couple amens. I well, love I it. I could do it with the best uh, of them, Rebecca. You know, I really can. Uh, I wanted to address <laughs> the evolution topic, lest I be accused of dodging it, and also to sort of preview our conversation about evolution. I think my take on a lot of this might surprise you guys. So first off, I just want to confess that, like a lot of a lot of good Christians understand, you cannot trust people who take money from the government. Okay, so this this Minnesota Iraq the program. Uh, what does this say? It's, it stands for Institutional Research and Academic Career Development Award. All right. This program is an NIH funded. That means National Institute of Health funded collaboration between the University of Minnesota and the nearby community colleges of Blase's and the Glavenoids and the PhD scholars who want to transition to the uh, tenure track faculty positions and research related employment upon completion of their fellowship, folks. All right. So why am I telling you that? That's what we call radical transparency from the pulpit. I'm just laying my cards out there. And so what I'm going to tell you is I, I don't I don't I don't I don't really care about evolution, okay? Okay, let's be clear, okay? You shouldn't trust me because as you can see, all I do is take your sweet sweet tax dollars. Yes, yes you out there in the audience. Yes, you James, you my one black friend, you Rebecca. I take your sweet sweet tax dollars and I convert it to this here this here Stacks and stacks and stacks of cash as the university pays me to indoctrinate children. indoctrinate children for evolutionary biology. So it might surprise you to say to hear me say this. I actually don't give about evolution. It's it's a very utility based relationship. I just do it for money because I'm corrupt and I've sold my soul to the government. Thank you, America. God bless America. All right. Furthermore, listen up, evolutionary biologists. This is something I've confessed to my colleagues recently. I think evolutionary biology is boring. It's so boring. And you know who makes it boring? Evolutionary biologists make it boring. Oh, my God, they're the worst with the genes and the regulation networks and the blases and the glavenoids. Oh, nobody cares. Oh, oh, my God, nobody cares. Oh, it's worse. Even you YouTube internet people, y'all do way too much talking and evolution about the abiogenesis and the macular degeneration of the evolutionary and the information can't come from randomness. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You guys put me to sleep faster than a goddamn baseball game. All right. Now, listen, folks. The truth is I don't think evolution is good. OK, it's not good. It's not bad. It's a theory. It's a scientific theory. Gravity is a theory. If you actually want me to care about evolution and feel responsible to teaching it to you, you have to pay me. That's the point of this. You absolutely must pay me. But sometimes on the Internet, I just dibble, I just drop a little nugget on you. But let me be serious with you guys I'm trying to be very serious. I'm trying to save evolutionary biology from itself. It's just so boring, which is why when I did my evolution presentation this year, I did it in costume. We did the call to the flying man. I introduced them to Purple Haze because I just think science communication is awful. And also, evolutionary biologists do what creationists do. They just say, look at the trees. That's what they do. Look at the trees. Look at the genome. Look at the phylogeny. Nobody cares. Go ahead, my one black friend. Tell them how boring it is. Never say to me. <laughs> Look at the trees. It is your ruin. 
But that's what they do, right? Don't do, don't biologists do that? The same thing. Look, guys, look at the trees and the oh, it's so. And look, so here's what I do. Honestly, I've I've told my my colleagues, if I'm gonna keep doing this for the rest of my life, I see myself as an evolutionary biologist. You will notice the hard E emphasis on the evil. Okay, I'm trying to study the evolution of bad behavior. And a lot of my research colleagues, we study cheaters. Uh, we study, like, how do people infiltrate different systems? How do you uh, evolve predators? I've recently gotten into evolving digital organisms that practice coercive mating. Yes, literally some rapey ass digital organisms. Oh, are you worried? Don't worry. They're computer programs. No ducks were harmed in the evolution of these coercive uh, programs. But you guys see what I'm getting at. Why? Because it's more fun. I'm not trying to do this look at the trees, feel good about evolution. So if you think you're going to counter apologize me with Jay, you're corrupt and you just do you just do science for money and you're part of the great government cover up. I already told you that. And if you're going to tell me, Jay, you feel good about evolution and you love it, and I think I'd be like, no, I think it's boring. So I think you're right. I don't really care about it. And I'm just trying to actually study the evolution of really bad things so I can agree with you that. Evolution's bad, and it's gonna, it's the reason we're all gonna die. All right, so, so that's my take on evolution. All right, just so we're clear. It's, it's awful, it's horrible. So evolution doesn't just say look at the trees, it says, oh, so let's look at the flesh-eating bacteria. And all there these there you go, there you let's go. Look all let's look it. at let's the look COVID-19 at and the cancer and the blase and the glavenoids. Yeah, it's all terrible. Sure. Yeah, so folks, uh, we could do this show forever, but uh, we, we, we got to wrap. That way, you, uh, you guys, uh, we always leave them wanting more, as they say in show business. Uh, I want to thank the chat. What up, Hillary's emails? What up, Lena? Bread of Life, Cameron, BS Lewis, YouTube Punk. Uh, I'm, I'm probably forgetting a whole bunch of folks because, uh, you know, I don't want to sit here and scroll back through the whole thing. But look. I love you guys. We appreciate you. Uh, this has been an incredible stream. It's been super, 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 super fun. James, thanks so much for doing this. We'll yeah, keep talking you. in uh, Discord yeah, and uh, talk about yeah. what we're doing in the future. We'll definitely have you back on Hot Program. And uh, we're going we're gonna to do what we do uh, in order. I'm going to give my concluding thoughts. Then I'm going to turn it over to my one black friend. And then we're going to actually let our guests close it out. So my concluding thoughts are James is awesome. Stay tuned. Uh, love the community. I just want to say on a corny note, we've had some recent uh, YouTube accomplishments, like a viewer count and subscribers and all that stuff going up. So thank you guys so much for supporting us. And uh, one thing I love about this community above all else is that we're all here together. Believers, non-believers, we're all here. We've all got a role to play. And I'm just so happy to see uh, that happening on this channel. Uh, go ahead, my one black friend. I don't really have anything to add other than uh, many thanks to James for joining us today. So it's nice to have a guest and thank you for sharing your views with us and your advice. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much, James. And James, the floor is yours. Take your time. Uh, anything you want to say at all. So I loved being here on this thread. But, you know, we have a great intermixing or interplay of ideas and energies and thoughts and it's it, it's it's thought provoking in ways that I didn't even expect, and I love that I've had this experience, and I hope I get to have many more with both of you. And, oh, awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome! So, one one thing about the evolution thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go for it. Up. Yeah, yeah, take your time. A evolution does not. I tell have my a friends I'm power. Go ahead. Evolution as a debate, or even as a truth versus untruth, does not have a lot of power to sway minds one way or the other about whether or not there's a God, whether or not we should be worshiping him or not. If someone were to convince me tonight or tomorrow that evolution is totally bogus and we must have been created, th there is no bridge you could even build to get me from, oh, there must have been a designer to, oh, well, I must believe in Jesus and the ransom sacrifice and all that other stuff. There's, there's just no way to build the bridge from here to there to there um so you know it's not a sticking point for me it evolution I, I believe or perspective that evolution is true on my layman part 
is not what keeps me an atheist. It's not what made me an atheist. It's not what keeps me an atheist. Um, there's no major victory to be had there for a religious person, even if they can convince me that evolution's bogus. It's not gonna, and I'm not gonna end up making some big giant leap of faith to say, oh, well, then all these stories about Jesus must be true. Like, it doesn't logically follow. Yeah, and, and you know, bonus conversation, guys. I actually agree with you. Like I said, my buzz, my uh, thing, I, I stole it from my teaching advisor, but it's uh, evolution is about as atheistic as plumbing, right? It's just a science, just like the other ones. But at the same time, uh, that's a challenge to people like Bread of Life and Rebecca. The same signs, like when you say, hey, I'm down with medicine, whether it's uh, evolution believers or non-evolution believers who develop it, they're all using the same, you know, medicine. Yeah, well, they're all using the same scientific disciplines to study evolution. So interesting how you take the consensus of biology when it comes to medicine, but then not with, again, the same, it's the same biology. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And even if you want to say something like, oh, well, intelligent design creationism is, you know, uh, not looked at as well, much as it should be, and there's some evidence for it, and we've got good evidence from the Bible to believe the testimony of the apostles, well, then uh, you've got to then accept that we've got good evidence based on all these other scientific disciplines to accept evolution. Uh, or else I think you're being inconsistent about your assessment of the evidence, but to, the po to your point, I don't think it matters because it really doesn't say anything about the atheism versus God thing. I just think you should be consistent about your view of empiricism is all I'm saying. Uh, but further, um, I actually feel the same way about the Bible. This is what people don't get. This is why I called myself an atheist Christian, and I still would if, if atheists and Christians would let me, <laughs> which is like I became a full-throated professional evolution person as a Christian. Full-throated Christian. And even when I stopped believing in a literal God and even stopped believing in a historical Jesus, I didn't immediately start identifying as atheist. I literally just thought, oh, yeah, God's this idea humans came up with. And religion's always been our effort to, like, do this humanity thing better. And, like, religion's the, the thing we, we, like, try to wrestle with it together because it's not the government and it's not, you know, quite family. It's like this in-between thing where we really got to figure it out on our own, right? And so then it was like, oh, Jesus wasn't real. Like, great. Oh, that means, like, oh, he was, like, a better example because he wasn't real. And then the, the real is we got to figure out like how the example uh, makes us more Christ-like, right? In other words, I don't think people accept how much you don't have to take the Bible seriously or literally as a fundamental foundation to be a Christian or an atheist. Like, it, like I don't think that does as much lifting as either side thinks it does either. I know I might be in a very minority opinion there, but again, that was my actual experience as a Christian. You might not believe it, but Part, I think it was part of the cognitive dissonance and the identity and being in the community was when I let go of biblical literism and historical Jesus, I was a Christian and remained one for quite some time. And the only reason I really started identifying as an atheist was I got tired of arguing with people about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, just, just, just my little take on it. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'll let us, I'll let us end there again. I want to thank uh, not just all the chatters, uh, of course, all our mods and all the people that have been super active, but all the viewers uh, and especially mm -hmm. the people who watch this later and or just put it on in the background and check out the conversation. Even if you don't make it through uh, the, the whole thing, we really appreciate that. Uh, I did put a, a, a comment, uh, a question down there in the comment section. Um, so go ahead and answer the question of the day uh, if you if you don't mind. Uh, we appreciate that just as a way to uh, get the get the conversation going for the people who watch later. Maybe I'll uh, take a shot at it myself just to uh, put something down there people can respond to. Uh, Want to thank our guest James Apperson again for helping <laughs> us out here uh, in the name of the dark. Wait, uh, before I forget, check out James's channel right. Uh, can they just, uh, you know, can we click on your name and follow, look up James Apperson and your channel will come up and also follow his Facebook. Anything else you want to plug? So my Facebook has my blog link and really that's going to be, um, advertised heavily by me at least once I actually turn it into video content. That's going to be the thing. So watch for it. All right. So, so just be, be ready. Facebook and YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yep. Be ready. Anything be else ready. you want to plug my one black friend? Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
All right, uh, I, I'm doing the Christopher Hitchens audiobook series later. Uh, I'll be live in a few minutes on Pocket Locker 86, and then I'll be doing the uh, audiobook. Uh, you know, I decided to do like an atheist audiobook series. We call it the Atheist Crew Book Club. Uh, that'll be tonight at 11 p.m. on Jay Bundy. But if you want more content from me, Pocket Locker 86 is always the way to go right now. Like I said, I'll be live on Pocket Locker 86 in about five or 10 minutes. I'm just going to go to the restroom and then uh, fire it up, do some stuff with my gaming club uh before tonight's uh book club show and then uh yeah thank you everybody uh what well, i'm gonna call it uh yeah yeah thanks again in the name of the darwin the dawkins and the christopher hitchens uh science bless all of you uh be good to yourselves